Okay, good afternoon, everyone. And welcome uh, to the City Planning Commission. Uh, my name is Dan Gorodnik. I have the privilege of chairing uh, this commission. Uh, commissioners, welcome, good afternoon. Today is May 9th. Um, for those of you who are joining us for the very first time, uh, today we're gonna have a public review session uh, among the commissioners of city planning, uh, where the staff of the Department of City Planning briefs the commission uh, on applications that are about to begin uh, the official land use process. That's uh, what we call certification at the very beginning of ULERP. Uh, or we'll have a public hearing on Wednesday, also before this commission at 10 o'clock. So today we have a number of really interesting examples of bread and butter proposals that uh, will help us create some homes and jobs for uh, New Yorkers. There are uh, some projects that are starting public review today that will include affordable housing, job opportunities, some that do a little bit of both. One of the, uh, the largest Brooklyn proposals uh, set to start public review so far this year is Innovative Urban Village, uh, which is in East New York. Uh, and it is proposed by the not-for-profit faith-based Christian Cultural Center. The project will be presented for the first time today uh, to the commission. Uh, you all will hear about its 2,000 affordable homes, trade school, grocery store, performing arts center, open space, and more. It is near Shirley Chisholm State Park, uh, NYCHA housing, and Starrett City. Uh, in the Bronx, uh, we will hear about two different HPD proposals. In uh, Morris Heights, HPD has a proposal to finance 28 affordable homes and two new rental buildings about a mile from each other and both near the Fortrain uh, and part of city planning's Jerome Avenue neighborhood plan, which we are very, very happy to see is uh, starting to bear fruit. And in Morrisania, HPD is applying for a 100% affordable building with 23 condos to be permitted on a city-owned site on Chisholm Street, which is a five-minute walk, five-minute walk from Potomac Park. Um, and we are happy to see city-owned sites being uh, put to use to meet uh, neighborhood meet needs here. Um, and finally, starting the process today is a project in Dutch Kills, Queens. Uh, to bring over 230 homes, 60 of them affordable, uh, new retail, space for an existing water tank business uh, to a transit rich corner of Queens with several subway stations, bus stops, city bike stations only a couple blocks away. Uh, <coughs> excuse me. So we are excited about getting starting, started with these uh, projects. Uh, and after the certifications, we are going to prep for uh, some of Wednesday's public hearings which will include uh, in Queens, the 77-39 Blay Place rezoning, um, the 11th Street and 34th Avenue rezoning, NYPD office space, um, uh, which is a lease, um, uh, 41 Summit Street, and uh, a discussion about how we will uh, handle video conferencing in um, future commission meetings. So that's the agenda for the day. We're glad to have the commission uh, here and ready to go. Uh, and Ryan, I'm going to turn to you uh, to kick off our Brooklyn certifications. That's right. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon. Welcome to the New York City Planning Commission review session. Uh, uh, the first item on our agenda today is the certification of a zoning map and zoning text amendments and special permits in Brooklyn Community District 5. Our presenter is Karina Leung. Karina? Thanks, Rain. Hey, commissioners. Okay. So this is, uh, as Ryan said, a private application for rezoning, text amendments, and special permits to facilitate innovative urban village, uh, which I specifically before was a faith-based mixed-use development with over 2,000 homes that would be anchored by a community-oriented core comprising of a new performing arts center, a daycare, an adult trade school, and the existing Christian Cultural Center. Next slide. Um, next slide, please. Okay. 
Uh, the project will be located on a 10 acre site in the East New York neighborhood of Brooklyn Community District 5, shown here in the thick dotted outline. As you can see here, the project is in the eastern part of Brooklyn within a mile of the Belt Parkway, as well as the three and the L trains. Next slide. The project was conceived of and is being driven by the Christian Cultural Center, which is a non-denominational church that was founded by the pastor who still leads the church today. The CCC, as it's known, draws parishioners from the local community and from across the city. The building has a footprint of 56,000 square feet and its main worship hall can seat 3,800 people. The CCC is more than simply a house of worship. Um, it also contains spaces such as a, a, a cafe, classrooms, meeting rooms, uh, and gathering spaces that organizations use for other functions, um, for other functions uh, like group meetings, graduations, um, hiring and training vets, et cetera. Uh, the, uh, the CCC organization owns all pretty much all of the land shown here between the trees um, on either side of the image. Um, you can see that it's mostly used for parking. Um, and so CCC found a partner with experience developing mixed use projects, the Gotham organization. And then together they're, they're proposing to create an urban village around the existing CCC building, supporting and growing the community by providing uh, new housing opportunities, uh, services, and cultural and social activities. Next, next slide. The unique aspect of this project is its community facility core consisting of the CCC, the Performing Arts Center, uh, which they're calling the PAC, a child care center and adult trade school, all located around a, pub a public lawn at the center of the site called the Central Quad. Surrounding this core would be eight residential buildings ranging from 12 to 15 stories with ground floor commercial use around the peri perimeter of the site. An internal network, street network with, and landscaped public open space would invite the public into the site and integrate it with the surrounding area. In total, development would include nearly 2 million square feet of floor area and have over 2,000 units of housing, over four acres of public open space, and nearly 900 parking spaces in total. Next slide. The project is located along the south side of Flatlands Avenue between Louisiana Avenue on the west and Pennsylvania Avenue on the east. Flatlands and Pennsylvania are both main thoroughfares and designated local truck routes. The project site is also just north of Sterrett City, which is now called Spring Creek Towers, which has uh, 5,800 affordable housing units, as well as two schools, a retail and a recreation center, all within, uh, all within their property. Then less than a mile east of the site, there are two significant mixed use developments on public land to note. Um, the gateway development, which you may recall, um, which the commission recently saw an application for. This includes the very popular Gateway Center Mall and 2,500 units of housing. Um, this is shown in blue. And then next to that in orange, the Fountains and Brooklyn Developmental Center uh, mixed use projects will have um, over 4,000 units when complete. Um, there's also a significant amount of open space in the area as well, about one mile south uh, on the other side of the Ball Parkway, um, the 400 acre Shirley Chisholm Park has amenities like biking, fishing and picnic areas, and the Brooklyn ball fields uh, is catty corner to the development site on the Northwest. Next slide. Okay, so in this image, um, North is kind of uh, turned around, it's at eight o'clock. So that's opposite from what we were looking at before. Um, the surrounding area, uh, as you can see here, has a mix of built forms with both tower and park and two to three story attached homes. Um, you can also see that there's a one story retail with large parking lots and one story warehouse buildings with, um, uh, with automotive uses and open lots in the Flatlands Fairfield IBZ. The area is served by multiple bus lines running along Pennsylvania and Flatlands Avenue generally. Uh, these include two express buses to Manhattan, a select bus that connects the development site with the L train and two stops, a limited bus to downtown Brooklyn and three local bus routes 
two of which connect to the L train and then one that connects the development to Gateway Center Mall and the three train. As part of this project, the applicant would also provide shuttles to the L and three trains for the use of site residents and visitors. Next slide. The blocks north of Flatlands Avenue opposite the development site are part of the Flatlands Fairfield Industrial Business Zone or IBZ. And accordingly, the area is largely uh, has industrial uses and is zoned M11. There are one story commercial retail and automotive related uses, however, along Flatlands and Pennsylvania. The rest of the surrounding area is generally residential and zoned R5, though there are areas along Flatlands, Pennsylvania, and Louisiana with one story retail uses um, and large parking lots, which have various C2 commercial overlay districts map. R5 districts allow residential uses at 1.25 FAR and community facility uses at 2 FAR in buildings with a maximum height of 40 feet. When a commercial overlay is in place, up to one FAR of commercial use is allowed. Next slide. So this image is looking east along Flatlands Avenue from the intersection of Louisiana. You can see the development site on the right behind the dotted line. And on the left, um, you can uh, kind of see that there are the automotive uses uh, on the north side of the street. Next slide. So this image is, is um, looking south down Pennsylvania from Flatlands Avenue. Uh, again, you can see the development site on the right, and then uh, you can see the surrounding context of Tower and Park buildings. Next slide. This image is looking north along Louisiana near the intersection of Vandalia Avenue. A one-story shopping center from the 80s uh, is, to, is on the left and NYCHA's Vandalia complex for seniors is on the right, just behind the trees. Um, you can see that Louisiana Avenue, which is 70 feet wide and classified as a narrow street actually feels much broader in this context. Next slide. The development site has about 600 feet of frontage along Louisiana, Louisiana, 1,000 feet along Flatlands, and about 300 feet along Pennsylvania, um, and then a total size of 10.3 acres. The only development on this site is the two-story Christian Cultural Center, uh, which is uh, shown here in orange. It's approximately 90,000 square feet in total, um, which is a 0.2 FAR across the entire site. The striped portion uh, of the site has 385 parking spaces around the church. Um, and until the pandemic had started, the church also used uh, the two lots on the, the, um, the eastern half of the site for overflow parking for about 400 vehicles. Uh, within the last year, the CCC did start allowing a bus company to temporarily locate vehicles here. The site is currently accessed by two driveways along Louisiana Avenue and two along Flatlands Avenue. Next slide. The applicant seeks to develop the site with a mix of residential community facility and commercial uses. The proposal includes 10 new buildings, which would be or which would consist of eight mixed use residential buildings, a performing arts center, and a parking garage. The proposal also includes over four acres of public open space and, and an internal network of private streets that we built to DOT standards and essentially act and feel like public streets. The CCC would be maintained um, and anchor the core of the community oriented uses located around a 20,000 square foot central quad. Um, so you have the trade school for adults, the CCC, the PAC, and a child care center that wraps around a playground that's also open to the general public. Uh, the eight residential buildings uh, would be located along the site perimeter and would have local retail or other commercial uses on the ground floor. The continuous street fronts or storefronts along Louisiana and Pennsylvania would be enhanced by five foot sidewalk widenings on these streets in front of buildings one, three, five, and six. The public parking garage uh, would be located behind the PAC and the CCC and would contain um, the approximately 110 required accessory parking for all the retail and commercial uses, or sorry, retail and community facility uses on the site. 
it would have a maximum capacity of 500 spaces to accommodate the needs of large events like Sunday services, but it's not expected to be utilized at full capacity all the time. Um, normally, the public garage is only accessed from Louisiana, uh, but there is a shared street in the shaded area to the north and west of the central quad that would be opened up for traffic to leave from, from the garage onto directly onto flatlands after large events. Um, and all other times, this area would be blocked off to traffic and uh, is open to pedestrians. Residential parking would be accommodated separately from the public parking. Um, there would be approximately 390 spaces provided for the residents, which would be distributed across resident residential parking garages that would be accessed in buildings two, four, and nine, building 910. In addition to breaking down the super block into a more pedestrian scale with a new street grid on the eastern side of the site, the plan also calls for developing a network of pedestrian paths through, through landscaping with pedestrian amenities, such as benches and tables. The entry plaza and the open space around the CCC would connect to uh, the central quad, connect to the central quad and the internal streets to facilitate the movement of people throughout the site. Next slide. Um, so now taking a look at uh, some images of what the project would look like. This is a view of the intersection of Pennsylvania and Flatlands where the applicant proposes to include a grocery store at the ground floor. Um, commercial spaces are planned for the ground floors along the entirety of the site perimeter facing the public streets, um, as you can see here. Next slide. This is a view along uh, the interior street that runs parallel to Flatlands Avenue on the eastern half of the site. This is a res residential street that's lined with masonettes, which are essentially two-story row houses that have their that each have their own individual entrance uh, directly onto the street. These provide a transition between um, between the street and the 12-story uh, multifamily residential buildings behind them. Next slide. This is a view within the development uh, looking south from the main project entrance at Flatlands Avenue toward the central quad and the pack. To the right, you can see a two-story arcade that would allow for direct vis visual connection to the pack and the quad from outside of the project. Next slide. This is a view of the entry plaza at the corner of Flatlands and, Pencil er, and Louisiana looking into the Christian Cultural Center. Um, this would replace the existing CCC entry plaza with one that's much more inviting and open um, that would have lush landscaping and seating and would be ADA compliant. Next slide. From the entry plaza, uh, moving within the site along the north side of the CCC, you'd arrive at this view of the central quad, which is uh, supposed to be fully open to the public. Um, the applicants have said that they intend to program the space with publicly accessible events, um, and that would complement the surrounding uses. Next slide. So in summary, the proposed development would total 1.9 million square feet, including about 100,000 square feet each of commercial and community facility space. There would be approximately uh, 2,050 residential units, all of which the applicant intends to be income restricted, plus over four acres of new public open space, about 900 parking spaces, uh, with 500 of these for public uses and the remaining for the residents. Um, DCP is pleased with the proposed site plan and the massing, uh, but does note that the agency is working with the applicant to refine certain design elements and details of public open space in the parking garage during public review. Next slide. To facilitate the proposed development, the applicant is requesting a rezoning, zoning tax amendments, a special permit for a large scale general development, and a special permit to allow for the proposed parking garage. Next slide. Um, so first the applicant is requesting to rezone an area um, that's roughly the same as the development site and is currently zoned R5. 
They're proposing an R72 zoning district with a C24 commercial overlay over the entire area. Um, R72 districts uh, allow residential uses to a maximum FAR of 4.6 when paired with mandatory inclusionary housing or MIH, um, and then a maximum FAR of 6.5 for community facility uses. When you uh, have that paired with a C24 overlay as proposed, retail and other commercial uses would be permitted up to two FAR. Uh, with MIH, quality housing regulations are mandatory. And within the R72 districts, buildings are required to be located at the street with a base height between 70 and 70, or sorry, a base height between 40 and 75 feet and the maximum building height of 135 feet or 13 stories. Next slide. Um, the applicants proposing to map um, uh, to map an MIH area, uh, that would be, um, or sorry, the applicants proposing an amendment to Appendix F of the zoning resolution to add a new MIH area that would be coterminous with the rezoning area. They are proposing MIH option one, uh, which broad, broadly requires that 25% of the res residential floor area is permanently income restricted to households with an average affordability at 60% of AMI, which is currently approximately $72,000 for a three person household. MIH option one further requires that 10% of MIH area is affordable to households at 40% AMI, which is approximately $48,000 for a family of three and limits the highest income ban um, for MIH units to 130% of AMI or $156,000 for a family of three. The applicant has said that the proposed development will be 100% uh, or is intends for the proposed development to be 100% affordable and that it would comply with option one. The applicant, or sorry, next slide. The applicant's also proposing to change uh, a change to Appendix I of the zoning resolution to expand the transit zone, which is shown here um, shaded in the kind of yellowish color. Um, the area that they were proposing to add is shown here in um, magenta, uh, and this is coterminous with the rezoning and the MIH areas. The transit zone was established in 2016 as part of citywide zoning reforms called Zoning for Quality and Affordability, uh, or ZQA. Within the transit zone, the parking requirement for certain income restricted housing units, or IRHUs, um, is eliminated. The applicant has said that approximately 1,500 of the proposed units would qualify as these IRHUs, and which are subject to a 15% parking requirement in R72 districts. Um, and then re uh, the remaining units would, would be subject to a 50% parking requirement. Um, and that would require the development to provide 487 residential parking spaces. However, with the expansion of the transit zone, the requirement would re be reduced to 256 spaces for residential uses. Next slide. The commission recently saw this explainer on large scale general developments, um, which broadly allow you to look at the whole site as a single zoning lot and allows for bulk modification to support a better site plan. Next slide. The applicant is seeking a large scale general development special permit to allow for modifications to yards, distance between buildings and height and setback regulations. Some of these waivers are needed due to regulations imposed when developments are adjacent to an R5 district, as this would be. Um, these are in place generally to preserve the lower scale character of R5 districts. Um, but that, you know, I want to know that this is not actually represented by the, the character of the development to the south. Next slide. So first, the applicant is requesting a waiver to the maximum building height of 135 feet or 13 stories for portions of buildings along flatlands in Pennsylvania, which are wide streets, um, actually very wide streets at over 100 feet in width. The plane with the dashed outline shows approximately where this 135 foot building height limit lands and the areas 
in Magenta show where buildings exceed both the height limit and the 13 story limit, um, which uh, is one to two stories. The blue portions show where the buildings meet the 13 story limit, um, but exceed the 135 foot height limit. Next slide. This image highlights portions of the proposed buildings that would not comply with zoning, which requires that buildings must have a continuous street wall between four to seven stories uh, or 40 to 75 feet. Uh, and then you know, beyond this, buildings are supposed to set back 10 feet along wide streets and 15 feet along narrow streets, such as Louisiana, before rising any higher. So with the interior street network and the significant low scale buildings that are on the site um, from like the PAC and the Perrine Arts Center, um, you know, there's limited area to put the bulk of the res residential buildings on the site. So DCP worked with the applicant to develop building forms that are appropriate for the site, but which would, um, and which would visually break up the bulk of these buildings while also allowing for continuous activation at the street level, which is an important component of the site design. The project massing relies on allowing building portions to have a sheer rise to the top floor, with some of these portions located at the street wall, thus exceeding the maximum base height of 75 feet, um, which are the areas shown in magenta, while other portions of the buildings are set back above the ground floor, creating areas where the base height is not tall enough. And so those areas are shown in blue. Along Louisiana, the building forms um, follow the same pattern, uh, but there is a, the 15 foot setback requirement above the base height um, since Louisiana is a narrow street. Um, so in addition to the building portions at the street wall that rise above the maximum base height, um, there's a shallow amount of area along the facade um, up, that ranges from about five to, set to eight feet. Um, that would be that would also require a waiver since these these areas would exceed the maximum 70 foot height limit within 15 feet of Louisiana. Next slide. The applicant is also requesting waivers to the, the minimum distance between buildings, which range from uh, 40 to 60 feet, depending on the presence of legally required residential windows. So the areas shown in magenta are areas where the minimum distance is not met between uh, the proposed buildings and the Christian Cultural Center. Um, so that's buildings five, six, uh, seven, eight, and nine, ten. Uh, distances in these areas range from 30 and 30.5 feet to 48 feet, where the required distances are actually 40 to 50 feet. Applicant is also requesting waivers for minimum distances between proposed buildings, um, uh, between proposed buildings. Um, these areas are highlighted in blue. So between the pack in building four, um, there's a 50 foot distance required, but only 34.5 feet would be provided. Uh, but between buildings five and six, and between buildings seven, eight, and nine, 10, a 60 foot distance is required, but this would be reduced to 50 feet. And then uh, on building nine, 10, um, there's two portions of that building above nine stories where the min minimum distance of 60 feet would be reduced to approximately 39 feet. These waivers are being requested to ensure a sufficient building depth and adequately sized residential floor plates. Next slide. Um, so generally 30 foot rear, rear yards are required for residential use and 20 foot rear yards are generally generally required for non-residential uses along shared lot lines since the site is adjacent to an r5 district eight foot side yards are also required the applicant is requesting to fully waive the required side yards um, which are shown in magenta on buildings two and building 910 and is requesting to fully waive the required rear yards on the parking garage, the pack, and building four. Um, because the proposed buildings are located at the per perimeter of the site to accommodate for the internal street network and open space. Next slide. And then lastly, the last um, 
bulk waiver that's being requested uh, pertains to the transition rule uh, in section 23-693 of the zoning resolution. Um, this, this regulation requires that there's a transition area between higher height and density districts and lower height and density residential districts. So within 25 feet, and what it states is that within 25 feet of the R5 zoning boundary, building heights are limited to either 45 feet um, generally or 55 feet when located like along a wide street. Um, this is to ensure the, that there's a visual transition to the 30 to 40 foot height limit allowed in an R5 district. The dashed line indicates this 25 foot area and the shading indicates where your proposed building heights are taller than the, 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 the 45 height allowed in magenta or in blue taller than the 55 height allowed. So here along Pennsylvania, building two rises to 120 feet and in that blue portion and um, and then within the 25 foot band where there's a 45 foot height limit, uh, buildings range from a height of 50 feet, uh, which is the pack to um, a maximum height of 114 feet. Next slide. The applicant is also requesting a special permit pursuant to section 74 512 of the zoning resolution, which states that within these districts, um, the commission may permit parking garages with more than 150 spaces and can further permit rooftop parking. Next slide. In order to grant the special permit, the commission must take the or must make the following findings. Um, note that finding up is not applicable in this application. The commission is also allowed to impose additional requirements to preserve the character of the surrounding area and detail the applicant's detailed responses um, to these findings can be found in your briefing packages. Next slide. Um, so this is a reminder of where the parking garage is. Um, it's highlighted here and then the primary garage access um, that's also highlighted here is off of Louisiana Avenue. Uh, next slide. So this is the ground floor of the parking garage, which would be regulated by ticket gates. Um, a portion of the 25 required reservoir spaces would be within the garage and the required bicycle parking uh, would be on, located on the ground floor. Next slide. There would be uh, 45 spaces on uh, located on the roof of the garage shown here. And then you can also see in this image, the remaining reservoir spaces that are located um, within the site on the private street leading to the garage entrance. Next slide. So a draft environmental impact statement uh, was prepared pursuant to the requirements of Seeker. The DEIS uh, that uh, determined that there was potential for significant adverse impacts in the categories listed. I note that the um, open space impact is only temporary and would exist only during construction, um, as this impact is fully mitigated, or would be fully mitigated after the project is complete and all open space has been constructed. Potential mitigation measures for some categories have been identified and will continue to be explored and refined between the draft and final EIS. So for the impact to libraries, um, potential mitigations include the provision of computer labs and lounge spaces, lounge spaces with uh, free internet access for residents within the residential buildings. Um, the impact for publicly funded early childhood programs would be fully mitigated if the applicant provides 128 early childhood seats, um, either on site or funds off site seats um, or and or like makes or funds improvements to existing facilities. Um, if DOE finds it appropriate, uh, this could this uh, the, the early childhood program impact could be fully mit mitigated with approximately half of the space that's currently allocated to the daycare center on site. Um, potential traffic mitigations include a new traffic signal at Flatlands Avenue and Georgia Avenue, um, as well as monitoring after the building is constructed um, and formal agreements for managing traffic during peak demand on Sundays. Uh, 
Other mitigation measures for, tra for traffic include signal timing changes, parking regulation changes uh, to gain a travel lane at key intersections, and possibly lane restriping. Additionally, the applicant will be providing shuttles once the first two buildings are complete, which will be codified in the restrictive declaration. Uh, this concludes my presentation. I'll not take any questions that you have. Great. Thank you very much. Uh, and I know that there will be some for sure from the commission. L let me just kick it off and recognizing that we are just at the certification uh, you know, point of the process here and that uh, you are not the applicant, but let me uh, let me ask uh, some questions about the open space impacts and potential mitigation here. Um, this uh, the central the central quad as it's in, envisioned uh, in the applicant's proposal. Um, you know, it's it is it's right there in the middle of the entire uh, development scheme, uh, and I'm wondering if you have considered ways in which the applicant might uh, make that maximally accessible and appealing to the public, sort of a, um, you know, a community amenity that is beyond what the people who live in the buildings might enjoy? Um, the applicant, uh, thanks for that question, um, Chair Grodnick. Uh, the applicant has talked about an interest in wanting to um, program this space with events. Um, we would support that as long as um, you know it's really important to us that this space remains uh, freely accessible and open to the public. Uh, it is part of um, the public access area, which is required to be, uh, or like a pop space essentially, so it's required to be open to the public. Um, and, yeah. It's required to be open to the public. Are there ways to make it uh so that it feels uh, welcoming to program it, to connect it to the surrounding community, uh, or are we not at that stage of the game yet? Um, I think the, uh, that ULIP is definitely gonna be a good time to get input from the community on you know, what they would wanna see here, how, what would be important for them to make this feel welcoming and open. Okay. Um, and on the uh, on the timing of that quad, so what, at what point in the development, um, pri presumably these buildings are being built in the sequence in which they're numbered. Um, at what point will this quad come to be? Um, um, so currently, um, I believe the the. The schedule that we are working with, uh, the, the applicants estimated um, the last quarter of 2028. Um, the, this would come about midway through the project. Um, the applicant did say they are proposing to build the first four buildings um, before, uh, at least before the quad would be open. Okay, so it'd be four buildings, um, then, part, then the quad. Um, and part of that is, yeah. And part of that, um, you know, they are, they do want to keep the church open, you know, and available to the community during construction. Um, so they're going to start, their plan is to start building on the vacant portion of the lot first. Okay, great. Thank you. Commissioner Cerullo. Thank you, Mr. Chair. It really is a, a spinoff of the question you just posed. It, it was really a phasing, just to get a, a general sense if there was an understanding of what the phasing of this development was planned to be given its size um, and the number of buildings. And that linked obviously to the question about, you know, where does the public space fit into that phasing? But I didn't know if there was an order in which development would be prioritized or not. So it was a, you know, again, just a general question on getting a sense of how it was envisioned the development would take place and at what point do the amenities to the public kick in versus um, versus the, the physical structure and development of the site? Um, so the, the, thank you for your question. Um, the applicant is, is generally planning to construct the site from east to west. Um, the first four buildings on the east side 
um, east of the main street are expected to be completed first. Um, there will be, so uh, in total, let's see, each of the first two phases, which would consist of, uh, or how the applicant's describing it, the first four buildings would have um, approximately uh, 25 plus 35, um, sorry, about 60,000 square feet of publicly accessible area. Um, this is This would consist of basically the private street network and then the remainder of the um, 175,000 square feet of public open space that includes um, both the streets and the um, more pedestrian areas uh, would be completed after the first four buildings. Okay. Um, okay, so, um, well, okay, so, I don't want to get caught up in definitions, but the sort of public, publicly accessible space, but then being described as sort of the street network is sort of a little different than sort of the public space for the public to enjoy. Yeah. Uh, um, so I just wondered where that fit in. I mean, I think that was really um, where the chair was in, in I guess, where, where that fit into the process as well. So it's, again, like I said, it was a, a little bit of a, a a familiar question, um, but I, I guess, look, I realize this is early in the process, but it would be helpful to know, you know, we'll see. I'm sure the community will have many opinions about the the phasing and the process and, and what is available to them um, as a community. Uh, so we'll, we'll see more as, I guess, as we move on, but um, okay, I appreciate the response. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Cerullo. Commissioner Goodridge. Hi, I have a, thanks for your presentation. I have a few questions. Um, the first is, uh, I briefly read the packet and it says five, I think 513 under MIH. It's 100% affordable, uh, but 500 under MIH. Can you explain for me, because I don't know, can you explain for me the rest the remaining 1500, um, how those are affordable, if they're not permanently affordable, what happens? The language I'm reading is uh, 500 yeah, thank you. permanently affordable and then the rest, but it's 100% affordable. So I just wanna understand it clearly. Yeah, um, so five, so pursuant to MIH, um, 25% of the residential, effectively 25% of the residential units would be permanently restricted um, to uh, certain income levels, you know, as long as they com uh, comply with option one. And the remainder of the units, um, the applicant has uh, publicly committed to making um, or intends to make these affordable um, to various different income levels. Uh, via uh, both city and state subsidy programs. Um, these are generally on like term limited, um, but are having generally like HPD is now trying to structure them to encourage uh, developers to continue affordability at the end of these terms. Okay, uh, thank you. And then uh, uh, just a quick follow up on that. If, if like, let's just say if the developer later on doesn't want to commit to it, is there any accountability or um, they just can just change it or? Um, there's, it, sorry. Oh, I was just going to say that, that we, I, my understanding for HPD programs is that they uh, usually enter into a um, 30, it's like 30 year um, uh, agreement with the developer. And then the financing is structured such that it, it is strongly incentivized for them, for the whoever is owning the property in the future after those 30 years to refinance um, under you know, similar terms is how that's usually done. Um, but I will also note that all, all HPD projects that we we see are generally structured the same way so we'll have you know a udap disposition later on today that has a similar uh structure and um and so these are 
as a you know, sort of the insurance for the uh, the units that are non MIH units are like sort of this is the best that we get in the city is that there's these 30 year financing terms and then they are re, um, you know sort of refinanced after that time. And like I said, they're usually very strongly incentivized to um, you know, refinance under similar terms. Okay, thank you. My last question is um, the income bans. Um, what are they? Are they starting from 30% to higher? Um, so the, the applicant has uh, publicly stated that all of the units would be affordable to households um, at incomes of 100% AMI and below, and that 75% of the units would be affordable at 80% AMI and below. Um, they, uh, you know, they've been talking to the council, council member Barron um, and the public to try to um, kind of get the, the unit mix and the income mix um, working and they can certainly speak more to the income bans proposed um, at the public hearing. Thank you. When is the public hearing? Do we have it yet? Uh, it won't be, uh, we'll, we'll know once the community board uh, gives us their recommendation. Okay, thank you. We will follow up for sure. Yeah. Um, Commissioner, thank you, Commissioner Goodridge. Uh, Commissioner Ortiz. Hi, thank you. Um, I had uh, some questions about the retail. Um, there is about, well, you mentioned 107,000 square feet of retail. Um, where is the nearest commercial district here in the neighborhood? Um, so there, Flatlands and Pennsylvania are both kind of commercial. There, there's commercial, commercial uses along there. And then and Gateway Center Mall um, is a you know kind of destination uh, commercial like retail area. Um, and just to clarify that the hundred thousand square feet of um, commercial space is not just retail; it actually does include um, some of the other uses uh, that are technically um, fall into that commercial category, like the trade school, the adult trade school, Got is it. a technically a commercial so use. What is, um, as what is the that. Breakdown, I didn't see the breakdown between um, retail and community facility. Yeah, um, I don't have that at the moment. Um, we can- well, When it comes uh, back, it would be helpful yeah, for- we can, have, we can definitely get that. To share that. And, and in general, I'd like to see, you know, what kind of evidence we have that there is in fact sufficient demand for a hundred thousand square feet of retail slash community facility. Um, you know, either either in the neighborhood or generated by new development. Um, you know, about two thousand housing units. Uh, rough estimate. You know, a rule of thumb can generate about twenty five thousand square feet of retail. Can support about twenty five thousand square feet of retail. So, you know, we're we're well above that here. And I I'm just curious, sort of what the what the feedback is. From the community on if they're concerned about the impact this might have on, on you know, nearby small businesses um, or just businesses in general. I do see that there are two, um, two grocery stores in the immediate vicinity. So um, you know, curious whether this third one is competing with those or not. And I would like the, um, the development team to um, be able to respond to those when it comes back. Um, and in general, I just will say, I know we're very early on, but I'm not sure I understand the rationale for the for lining the exterior of the site with retail. Um, you know, I'd like for them to, to speak to the program and the site plan on that. And, you know, I think um, Chair Grodnick to your uh, comments about the open space, you know, it should be noted, there's no commercial activity um, facing the open space. And usually those things really help to activate open space and make it feel um, much more public. Um, you know, on the site plan, it's sort of internal to the site, um, somewhat hidden, could feel privatized. Um, and so commercial activity um, can sometimes help mitigate against that. So um, I would just be really interested in, in their, uh, you know, some more insight into why the site plan um, looks the way it does with respect to retail and open space. Great, we will, we will suggest that um, they yeah. uh, come and do that. Um, 
Thank you, Commissioner Ortiz. Did you have other questions or comments? I'm sorry. No, okay. Thank you. Um, Commissioner Ramprashad. Uh, thank you. Thank you for the presentation. I, I had the same questions as uh, Commissioner Ortiz with regards to the open space. I do feel like the central quad is kind of hidden away. One of the things I would like to know is um, in terms of this shared street connector, if they can provide more illustrations of what that looks like, will there be bike lanes going through street A, um, looking at and street B? Also, I'm curious about, I see there's basketball courts on top of the public parking garage. Is that accessible to who? The residents or to the public? And um, just if they can, like I said, provide additional renderings or what the program is really gonna be like for the entry plaza. And uh, also the breakdown of how many two bedroom, three bedrooms, I know it's still early in the process, but uh, those numbers, knowing those figures would be helpful. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner. Uh, Karina, do you want to add anything there? Go ahead. You're, you're muted. Sorry. Yeah. Just a note on, yeah. Um, so just a note on the basketball court. Uh, the applicant has, is planning to make that basketball court, you know, open to the public. Um, and that would be available um, when the roof like with the full capacity of the garage is not needed. Okay. Great. Um, all right. Thank you. Thank you, Karina. Thank you, Commissioner. Commissioner Marine. Thank you, Chair Garodnik. Um, so I, I want to, some of the questions I've heard that I thought I've already asked and answered, but the one I want to kind of piggyback on is the, the, the concern and question expressed by Commissioner Goodrich. And I do know that you know, on the 30, on the 25 or 30 percent of MIH, that's in perpetuity. We understand that. And we also understand that there'll be a separate regulatory agreement for the balance of the building for a certain period of time. But it would be very beneficial for HPD to come in and one, explain to us some of the mechanisms put in place to make sure that the building remains affordable, like the compliance monitor that is part of the formula, like the compliance period, like the effort to get more subsidy at the year 30 what the reverter clause is and the amount due back in the event that they decide to take the, the building out of um, the 100% affordability, the balance of the building out of the 100% affordability. What does that mean for the units as they're coming back online? Because just because you're going back, you, you're turning the building to market, let's just say for a minute, you still have to scale up that unit in terms of rent increases. So understanding what that would be, would be very beneficial to us as a body, because these are but projects that we're seeing more and more over, and I, I specifically see them in the Bronx. So it would be very beneficial for us to understand what those mechanisms are so we can assure that the affordability will be remaining in perpetuity. And when it's not, it's scaled up appropriately. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Marin. Karina, do you wanna? Um. Yeah, no, I think, uh, I mean, generally, I think you mentioned earlier, you know, that it's structured, so there's a balloon payment at the end, you know, which is the kind of the incentive, but um, we can certainly uh, 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 see if HPD can come in and do an explainer on this. Yeah, this might be something that is applicable more broadly to uh, projects that appear before the commission for understanding for everything. Thank you, uh, Ryan. Thank you, Karina. I will note uh, Karina is at a bit of a disadvantage today because of her her internet connection is uh, is slowing is slowing down her ability to hear and respond. And so I uh, we're sympathetic. So let's give her just a, a, a two or three seconds after we uh, speak to let her uh, respond. So uh, so she has a, a chance. I I think there's a little bit of a lag for her. Okay, Commissioner Bernie. Okay. Thank you, Chair. Uh, thanks, Karina. You, you don't actually have to respond to this, so you're good. You're good to go here. Uh, I just wanted to add to the discussion about the uh, central cord and ask whether it might not be worth talking to the applicant about switching the quad with building nine and ten, because that would give the quad as a public space um, more access, more access to Louisiana Avenue, as Chair Gronick was mentioning to the community, access to the cultural center, access to the performing arts center. And, and the public parking garage, it might just be a better location for a more public space if they can if they can make that work. So just worth thinking about, I think. Great. 
Thank you, Commissioner Bernie. Uh, Commissioner Levin. Um, uh, yes, thank you. Um, I have a host of questions uh, that are probably for the follow-up, but they all deal with the um, parking situation, which clearly is a major piece of this site plan, how you take um, a church that draws um, congregants from across the city and are currently parking, what, some 900 people sometimes, um, fill up the parking lots with development and still allow the church uh, to operate at that um, pace. Um, the garage seems in a very awkward spot in the site plan, but I think that's the definition of parking is that it's awkward. Um, but it's stuck into the middle of the site plan, backs up to, um, I still call it uh, Starrett City. I know it's got a new name. Um, what's it gonna look like adjacent for the, the, the folks who are on the back side of it? I think I noticed you've indicated there will be screening, um, but it still is a big dark behemoth stuck in the middle of the plan. Um, how does the, you know, what will the, traffic experience be with cars pouring out of that garage and through the shared street. Um, and then the notion of getting the, um, putting this in the transit zone so that the amount of parking required for the affordable housing is reduced um, really seems like um, a stretch given the distance of this site um, from the L to the L train. Um, so I know those are all issues that you've thought a lot about. And I think, Corinna, you intimated that you're continuing to work with the applicant on some urban design issues, and this may well be one of them. But um, I think there's a lot of complexity associated with the parking plan here that would be good to learn more about when it comes back to us. Um, and then just as a tiny detail, um, I'd love to know that they're putting a ton of bike parking into each of the residential buildings. Um, this is a great biking neighborhood because it's so transit challenged, but it's also flat. Um, and if we're pressed to provide um, parking, you know, the, the, the standard analysis says, oh, there'll be sufficient parking on side street, on the, you know, on public streets. Well, I don't think that's gonna fly here very well. But if we really made a model here of putting a lot of easily accessible um, bike parking in for building residents, um, I think that would be a very good thing. So that's it. Great, thank you, Commissioner Levin. Uh, plenty more to come on that one for sure. Um, okay. Uh, Karina, did you or Alex, did either of you have anything to uh, to add on that piece of this? Uh, I, I would just say that we're, we're happy to come back with the applicants to explain, to have the applicants explain their uh, detailed parking and uh, traffic pattern. Uh, we didn't get into too much detail with it, but um, there is a, a more complex traffic uh, pattern that we've worked on with them uh, to open up streets during, uh, services. And, and, um, I think the applicants can, can talk through some of the rationale about the, uh, expansion of the, of the transit zone as well. Um, and we'll take back the comments about ensuring that there's adequate and accessible, visible bike parking. Great. Thank you. Um, and let's see, I don't see any other commissioners wishing to, uh, ask any questions, uh, on this one. Uh, so Karina, thank you very much, uh, for all of your, hard work on this and so many other things. We really appreciate uh, you and this. And so we thank you for everything you uh, uh, you have done for uh, for the Department of City Planning. We're, we're very happy uh, and thank you. Um, okay, this item is certified, uh, Ryan. And so I'm gonna ask you to move us on to the next, uh, the next one. Sure, so we have on uh, the second item on our agenda is a recertification of 1571 McDonald Avenue. Uh, the commissioners may recall that this was certified at our, uh, I believe is our April uh, 25th uh, uh, review session. And uh, there was a technical oversight and the notice of certification wasn't sent out. So we need to recertify uh, this again. Um, we are working with the applicant and the community board and do not expect a, you know, much delay to do to this. Um, if there are any questions, I believe Josh Vogel 
from the Brooklyn offices here and uh, we will uh, just you know, recertify this and send this out and get the notice of certification out um, this time. Okay, uh, good, thank you, Ryan. Um, I don't see any questions. So um, with that, this project is recertified. So thank you uh, for that. And let's, uh, uh, we'll, we'll move uh, the necessary paperwork to, to get it going. Uh, right. Thank you. Uh, what's up next? The third item on our agenda is a certification of a UDAP designation and disposition of city owned land in the Bronx in Community District 5. And our presenter is Manny Ligaris. Manny. Okay, good afternoon, commissioners. Good afternoon. This is the Morris Heights NCP. Am I muted? Oh. You're good. We can hear you. <laughs> Morris Heights new construction program. Thank you. Uh, next slide, please. The applicant is the New York City Department of Housing, Preservation and Development. They are requesting UDAP designation, project approval, and disposition of city-owned property to a developer to be selected by HPD. The actions would facilitate the construction of two new residential buildings at West 182nd Street, which is developed in Site 1, and the other at 1647 Popham Avenue, development Site 2, these are in the Morris Heights section of Bronx Community District 5. Uh, some background on this uh, project uh, in 2014, HPD issued an RFP inviting applicants to submit development qualifications for the design and construction of high quality, new construction, affordable housing development projects on public sites available for this position. The goal was to promote neighborhood revitalization across the city through infill developments that would expand opportunities for affordable home ownership and create multifamily affordable rental buildings. This project that I'm presenting right now, Morris Heights NCP, is just for rental buildings. Next slide, please. Uh, development site one at 30 West 182nd Street. Next slide, please. Development site one, which is outlined in red, is bounded by West 182nd Street on the north, Davidson Avenue on the east, Clinton Place on the south, and Grand Avenue on the west. The immediate surrounding area contains one and two family residential, multifamily residential with elevator or walk-up, mixed commercial, residential, parking, and vacant lots. The development site is within the Jerome Avenue study area where there is a need for additional affordable housing. Public transportation is available via the number four elevated subway line at the Burnside Avenue station, located just three blocks northeast of the development site on Jerome Avenue. Three bus lines also run along Jerome Avenue and East Burnside Avenue. Next slide, please. The development site consists of a 2,500 square foot vacant and fenced lot located within an R71 zoning district. There is a mixture of residential, commercial, community facility uses in this area. Next slide, please. Uh, this is a photo of, of the development site. Uh, we are looking south at the site. The lot is currently vacant and fenced and is located between two residential buildings. Next slide, please. And here we're looking west at the site and the adjacent six-story buildings. Uh, next slide, please. This is the site plan of the proposed six-story residential building, which will contain 11 affordable dwelling units. The height of the building is 61 feet. It will have a rear yard of approximately 300 square feet of passive recreation space for residents of the building. Excuse me. The apartment distribution is zero studio units, 10 one-bedroom units, one two-bedroom unit, and zero three-bedroom units. No parking is provided. Next slide, please. Uh, these are the east and west elevations of the proposed building located at 30 West 182nd Street. Next slide. This is development site uh, two located at 1647 Popham Avenue. Next slide, please. 
The development site, outlined in red, is bounded by West 176th Street to the north, Popham Avenue to the east, West 175th Street to the south, and Undercliff Avenue to the west. Next slide, please. The area, the area map uh, shows that the immediate surrounding area is primarily residential, consisting of one and two family attached and semi-detached homes, medium density four to six story walker buildings and high rise elevator buildings with pockets of commercial and parking. The area is zoned R71. Next slide, please. We're looking at a photo of the 5,000 square foot development site which is currently vacant and fenced. Next slide. This is another photo of the development site looking south toward 175th Street. The site is located on the right. Next slide, please. The site plan of the proposed six story building, which will contain approximately 17 affordable dwelling units. The height of the building is 59 feet and the rear yard will contain 573 square feet of passive recreation space. No parking will be provided. Next slide, please. And this uh, slide shows how the uh, building will look like. Next slide, please. And these are the actions that will facilitate uh, the uh, proposed uh, project. Uh, UDAP designation, project approval, and disposition of city-owned property. I'd be happy to answer questions. Thank you very much, Manny. Let me see hey, if you're there welcome. Are... Commissioner Eady. Thank you. Thank you, Manny. Um, on the elevations, can you tell us what the materials are? on both the front and the back elevation? Uh, uh, on the, uh, the front is a brick material. Uh, the other one I'm getting, uh, I'm all, I, will, I have asked the HPD and they will provide the information what that material is, but basically it's brick with the other material. Brick on the front, but we don't know what the back is. All right. Okay, thank you. Okay, you're welcome. Thank you, Commissioner. Uh, Commissioner Bernie. Oh, thank you. Uh, thanks, Manny. Uh, just a quick question about um, 30 West, 30 West mm -hmm. 182nd. It seems like it's a very steep site, both front to back and as you're going up the sidewalk. And front to back, it seems to be an almost complete story changing grade. And you're not showing any floor plans, but I'm wondering how they're, how they're dealing with that in terms of the ground floor uh, of the building. Are they going to give us some okay. floor plans eventually, do you think? or? Or not? Uh, we, we do have floor plans, uh, but uh, I, I will get back to you on this. I will uh, try to get something better than what okay. we currently have. Okay. When it comes back. Actually, no, I, I do see the ground floor plan, uh, but it's not very clear because they're showing windows on the back and they're showing the floor mm -hmm. as if it were completely uh, flat. So I don't quite know how they're going to deal with the changing grade. That, that's just my only question. Okay, yes, I will bring this to their attention. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner. Uh, okay, thank you very much. Uh, we, uh, this, uh, this one is certified Morris Heights NCP. Uh, Ryan, you wanna bring us to the next one? Sure, so the fourth item on our agenda is a certification of a UDAP designation and disposition of city owned land in the Bronx uh, Community District 3, and Manny will present this one as well. Okay. Okay. This is the <laughs> Morrisania Open Door, located at 1312 to 1314 Chisholm Street. Next slide, please. Uh, the applicant is the New York City Department of Housing and preservation and development, and they are seeking you that designation, project approval, and disposition of city-owned property to a developer to be selected by HPD. The actions will facilitate the construction of a new residential building at this location. 
in the Morris Ania section of Bronx Community District Number Three. Now, the background on this is similar to what I read for the previous project. The difference is, is uh, this is this one is just for home ownership. Next slide, please. The development site, which is outlined in red is located on a block bounded by Jennings Street on the north, Bristol Avenue on the east, Freeman Street on the south, and Chisholm Street on the west. Next slide. The development site is within an R71 zoning district. The zoning area is primarily re residential with pockets of commercial and community facility uses. The residential building types include one, two, and three family buildings, multifamily walk-up buildings, a few multifamily elevator buildings, and mixed residential and commercial buildings. Public transportation is accessible by a several nearby by bus lines. The closest subway station is the uh, a quarter mile away at the Freeman Street station served by the number two and five lines. Next slide, please. This is a photo of the development site uh, view fronting on uh, Chisholm Street. The development site is currently vacant and fenced. Next slide. This is a view of the development site. There's a view looking southeast along Chisholm Street. Next slide, please. The site plan indicates the footprint of the proposed six-story, approximately 20,626 square foot uh, residential building. The building will contain 23 affordable dwelling units and the height is 59 feet. There will be 690 square feet of passive recreation space for the residents of the building. No parking is being provided. The uh, and this project is going through HPD's open door term sheet program. Next slide, please. This is a slide uh, showing uh, a, a bit of the information uh, that, where the program is involved. Uh, the sponsor purchases the site, constructs the co-op building, then sells the units to households willing to abide by the regulatory period of 40 years. This number was corrected. It was initially 20, now it's 40 years. Uh, the dwelling units are affordable to households with an annual household income at or below 80% of AMI. The buyer must be a first time buyer and a 10% down payment is required with two months reserves. If the owner decides to sell the unit, it must be sold to persons who qualify under the program. Uh, the AMI for this uh, area is $27,917. Next slide, please. And this is an elevation of what the uh, uh, proposed building uh, will look like. Next slide, please. And by the way, the materials there also are brick materials for that building. Uh, next slide is the, um, uh, the actions necessary, which will be the ULIP designation, project approval, and disposition of city-owned property. I'd be happy to answer any questions. Thanks, Manny. Uh, I, my question is not related to the, uh, the physical You're welcome. Uh, or the land use. It looks it certainly looks uh, like it makes sense there. Mm -hmm. I really just have one question about the open door uh, program. You said that there is it's for first time buyers under 80 percent of the AMI and that right. there is a down payment mm -hmm. required. Can you say a little bit about the down payment that's required here? OK, I. I don't have more than what I was uh, given by the HPD project manager. I would like myself to have additional information. So I will contact the project manager and get that information for you for when it comes back. Okay. Got it. I, I appreciate it. Just uh, okay. a point of curiosity. I just, uh, I would expect that it might be difficult oh, okay. for many <laughs> people to cobble together a down payment. Mm. Um, okay. Um, okay. Let me see see what else we've got here. Okay. Uh, Commissioner Dweck. Thank you. Um, Manny, was, I heard you say there, there, the restriction on selling it had to be to somebody else who qualified. Was there a restriction on the amount of profit or the, was there a time restriction on that sale? Uh, well, the uh, time restriction is that, that 40 years, uh, the, the, the period of time. So if the uh, 
owner of the uh, unit sells before that, uh, they they can sell, they can obtain up to two percent of uh, two percent of the aggregate of, of the value uh, up to forty years. And uh, you know my assumption is that after forty years it's going to be market rate, but that's a question that I put to HPD, and I'm waiting confirmation on that. But when you 2%. say two percent, you you, you mean two percent annual return? I was a little confused from the answer. Well, okay, yeah, I, it, it it is confusing. I'll get some clarification from HPD. So, in essence, the uh, owner can sell it after a few years, and they are limited on their return. So there's no restriction on holding them. A maximum of two percent profit they're able to earn if they sell it within that forty-year window. Can you repeat that? I couldn't hear it. Sorry, I didn't know that. Fact. There's a maximum of a two percent uh, profit they're able to make if they sell it within that forty-year term period. So, and it's okay. Again, my question is: Is it a two percent annual return or a total of two percent, which would seem we, we can confirm. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Commissioner. Mm -hmm. uh, Commissioner Marin. Sure, thank you very much, Chair Garodnik. Um, Commissioner Dweck, my understanding from having developed under this program, it's at 2% every year above um, what value is. But my, my question is a little bit more um, regarding the 40 year. So in other words, I'm signing as a homeowner a commitment that for me to receive full value of the subsidy, I have to live in this unit for at least 40 years. Um, I still I do have the same question about the percentage. Is it based on the value of the unit at the end of the year, or is it based on the per original purchase price? I do understand that you have to have a qualified buyer. And my only other question is, it, it, you're saying this is a condo, right, Manny? It's a co-op. It's a co-op. Oh, it's a co-op. It's a co-op. Has, has the applicant considered like uh, a community land trust um, would be my only other question. It, it, it has been considered. I will ask the applicant. That's been a conversation that's been ongoing, and I know HPD will be prepared to speak uh, about the community land trust. It is something that they have explored um, with all of these projects as, as they've come through. And, and just to confirm on the 2% appreciation, it is 2% appreciation on the original per purchase price per year of owner occupancy. So when you bought it, the amount of years per year um, since you've owned it. Okay. Thanks, Sean. I appreciate that. Thank you, Manny. Thank you, Commissioner. Okay. Uh, Commissioner Edie. Yeah, yeah, and I, I think my question was addressed. Um, it had to do with the fact that it was a co-op, whether or not they were using a community land trust. So I guess we'll hear more about that. Yep. Thank you. Okay, great. Uh, Commissioner Bernie. Oh, thank you. Uh, thanks, Manny. I apologize because you've answered this question for me before, and I think those brain cells have disappeared for some reason, but you'll have to tell me again. Uh, in terms of the common areas, the garden, the public spaces, the elevators and so on, I'm assuming the co-op agreement has some provision for these 23 units to collaborate and pay for maintenance of the common parts. Is that the case? There, there is a maintenance. It uh, might be the case. Uh, okay. Sorry, man. I'm not sure. No, no problem. Okay. There is a maintenance fee that's included, and there's a minimum um, percentage that it goes up each year. I want to say it's two percent per year minimum increase um, in the in the maintenance fee that you know in order to take care of it because it, it has been a problem. I know it was a problem with HPD's um, you know previous home ownership uh, term sheet, so that's something they factored in as, mm. as, as they thought through the open door program. Okay. So, so do, do they normally um, hire a maintenance person to do that, take care of the planting in the front and take care of the common areas and so on? Or how is that typically done? We, we can confirm. Yeah. Okay. It's just a concern because, you know, obviously poorly run co-ops can end up having the common spaces be really fall into disrepair and can be a real problem. So I think we need to make sure that provisions are made to solve that problem before it starts. So thank you. Thank you. Um, Commissioner Edie, I see your, uh, your yeah, name. Yeah, I, I had okay. one additional question. I just, yep. Did I understand that there is a cap 
on how much the maintenance costs go up each year? Did I hear someone say that? I believe there's actually a, a, a minimum on the amount they have to go up uh, per minimum year. That it I think it's a 2% minimum that it has to go up per year in order to make ensure they keep up okay. you know, with the current demand and they're able to get. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Commissioner. Uh, Commissioner Marin. Yes, I just wanted to answer David Bernie's question. Commissioner Bernie, excuse me, question. Commissioner Bernie, HVD will not allow you to close without having identified a property manager. And they'll, I'm sure they'll talk to that when oh. they come back. But part of the process is the developer must secure a property manager before closing to assure that there's someone who's going to take care of the property. There's a maintenance, there's a, 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 a reserve, operating reserve. There's a maintenance reserve that's in the budget that we set up when we first developed the budget. And it does go up a, certain, a minimum percentage every so odd years, once the board is set, they can elect to either raise that or, de or decrease that depending on their expenditures. And we can let HPD, you know, talk more to it. I just wanted to give you a bit of a background having developed these types of developments. Oh, that's terrific. Thank you for that. Thank you, Commissioner Marine. Okay, with that, thank you, Manny and uh, the Bronx team. Uh, this item is now certified. Uh, Ryan, what do you say? Are we ready for a new borough? Sure. We will uh, move to the Queens. Uh, the fifth item on our agenda is a certification of a zoning map and zoning text amendment in Queens Community District 1. And our presenter is Luis Garcia Martinez. Please. Hi. Um, good afternoon, commissioners. Uh, next slide, please. This is a private application by Crescent Street Associates LLC for a zoning map amendment from an existing M12 R5B and the M12 R5D zoning districts to an M12 R6A district and related zoning tax amendment to enable and establish mandatory inclusionary housing provisions within the special Long Island City Mixed Use District and the Dutch Kill Sub District to facilitate the development of an approximately 175,000 square foot seven-story mixed-use building containing 233 dwelling units, including 60 affordable units, and 17,000 square feet of commercial and light industrial floor area at 4025 Crescent Street in the neighborhood of Dutch Kills, Queens Community District 1. Uh, next slide, please. Um, this is an aerial view to the northwest of this area of Queens Community District 1. The parade area is located directly north of Queens Plaza, northeast of Hunters Point, south of the Ravenswood Houses, east of Queens Bridge Houses, and west of Sunnyside Yards. Next slide. The parade area is in the southern portion of the Dutch Kill Subdistrict of the Special Long Island City Mixed Use District. As a little bit of background, the 2001 Long Island City rezoning we zoned an area south of the Prague area in Long Island City as a Queens Plaza subdistrict, a three block area south of the Queens Plaza subdistrict as a new Court Square subdistrict, and the former Special Hunters Point Mixed Use District as a new Hunters Point subdistrict. In 2008, the Dutch Kills rezoning rezoned a 40 block area of Long Island City as a subdistrict within the Special District and map medium density contextual MX districts over low density manufacturing districts. Intending to create more predictable building scales, expand the mix of permitted uses and encourage an increase in residential development. Next slide. For visualization purposes, this aerial view of this section of Long Island City has been rotated so that the north is pointing to the right of the slide. Um, the surrounding area is characterized by its mix of uses and scales, ranging from vacant lots to one-story warehouse buildings housing industrial uses to 15-story residential buildings with ground floor local commercial uses. East and west of the project area, land uses range from unimproved parcels for parking, auto repair, and vehicle and material storage to five-story multifamily residential buildings. Building types in the area include two-story single-family homes and one- to two-story warehouse-style light industrial buildings occupied by businesses including antique stores, professional services, auto repair, and grocery and bakery wholesalers. The area immediately south of the project area, north of 41st Avenue, is improved with residential buildings ranging from two to six stories. 
Industrial uses include open parking areas, a gas station, a warehouse style, and warehouse style buildings, uh, housing businesses like auto repairs, plant nurseries, a recording studio, and restaurants. South of 41st Avenue, within approximately 200 feet of Queens Plaza North, buildings range from one to 21 stories, consisting of newer office and residential buildings, usually with commercial ground floors, and older industrial and retail buildings, uh, now mostly um, used as commercial spaces. Next slide. There are several community facilities within the surrounding area. The New Commerce High School, a public school specializing in educating new immigrants between grades nine and 12, is about 300 feet east of the project area. The Growing Up Green Charter School, the St. Patrick's Roman Catholic Church, and the Windmill Community Garden are between 500 to 600 feet northeast of the project area. The Evangel Christian School and Church are roughly 480 feet north, and the Q575 Academy of American Studies is about 350 feet north southeast of the project area. The project area is located within the transit zone. It is flocked four blocks east of the 21st Street Queens Bridge subway station with F train service, two blocks north of the Queensboro Plaza subway station with 7N and W train service, and about six blocks north of the Queens Plaza subway station with EMG and 7 train service. The Q3260, 101, and 102 buses stop two blocks south from the project area at Queens Plaza North and 27th Street. Crescent Street, a 60-foot wide street, features a two-way protected bike lane that connects Northern Astoria to the Queens Plaza network. There are several city bike stations located along Queens Plaza North, 24th Street, and 28th Street, as seen on the view here. Next slide. In this slide, the north is now uh, pointing to the top of the slide. And as seen here, the immediate surrounding area is characterized by a mix of land uses, including industrial manufacturing, residential, and public facility uses. Industrial uses are mostly located to the west of the project area, while commercial uses are mostly mapped to the east of the project area. The project area itself is currently split into an M12 R5B district to the east and an M12 R5D district to the west. The zoning districts allow for development of up to 3.0 FAR. Floor area above a base 2.0 FAR can only be used for designated industrial uses. So in the M12 R5D district, up to 1.65 FAR may be used for residential uses and up to two FAR may be used for community facility uses. In the M12 R5B district, up to two FAR May be, used for, uh, may be used for residential uses or community facility uses. The area directly south of the project area, north of 41st Avenue, is an M12 R6A district. M12 R6A districts allow for up to 4.0 FAR of development, of which up to 3.6 can be used for residential use with provision of MIH floor area or for commercial and manufacturing uses. Any development beyond 3.6 FAR must be used for designated uses. Uh, and the maximum building height permitted in the proposed zoning district is 85 feet or eight stories with provision of MIH floor, floor area on site. Uh, next slide, please. The project area consists of the applicant owned development site in block 406, lot 12, outlined in red here, and lots 9, 10, 11, 12, 29, 38, and 40 which are non-applicant owned. The project area is bounded by Crescent Street to the west, a line 100 feet north of 41st Avenue to the south, 27th Street to the east, and a line 80 feet south of 40th Avenue to the north. The development site is owned by the applicant, an affiliate of the Rosen Watch Group, which is a major supplier and servicer of water storage tanks and towers, cooling products and services, and has an area of approximately 45,000 square feet with 255 feet of frontage on Crescent Street and 200 feet of frontage on 27th Street. The development site is improved with four one-story buildings currently used as one uh, office space for pest, for pest control uh, service business, 
Two, a facility in which the owner stores and tests water tanks and cooling tower products. And three, a parking lot where food trucks and carts are stored and repaired. Uh, next slide. Here we can see a photo of the surrounding area with the development site outlined in red. In this view from Crescent Street facing Northeast, we can observe within the outlined area to the right, the brick building that is currently used by the pest control service. Um, to the left, we can observe a nine story tall building built in 2008 that currently operates as a, a, as a hotel. Finally, in this photo, you can also observe the two way protected bike lane along this section of Crescent Street. Next slide. Here we can see a view of the PEG area and development site as viewed from 27th Street to the Southwest with the development site outlined in red again. Um, the building furthest to the South within the development site is the building used by the current owner as storage and test facility um, for their water tanks and cooling towers. Um, the section to the North is the area used to park, store and repair food trucks. And we can observe the access point to this part of the lot in the middle portion of the um, outlined area. Finally, in the background, we can observe part of the higher density developments in the Queens Plaza South District. Next slide. In this last photo, we can see an image uh, from the intersection of Crescent Street and 41st Avenue looking southwest where we can once again observe the two-way protected bike lane to the left with some older and newer developments on both sides of the street uh, with higher density developments further south in the background. Next slide. The proposed rezoning would facilitate the development of a new seven-story mixed-use building containing around 175,000 square feet of floor area. Um, the new building would contain uh, 233 dwelling units with approximately 158,000 square feet of residential use on the ground floor and upper floors. 60 of these units or close to 40,000 square feet of the residential uh, floor area would be affordable pursuant to MIH option one. The proposed building street wall would be located at the street line and would rise to a height of 65 feet on both Crescent Street and 27th Street before setting back 15 feet and rising to a height of 75 feet. A portion of the building fronting Crescent Street within 25 feet of the adjacent M12 R5D district to the north would rise to a maximum permitted height of 55 feet and will have permitted dormers on the seventh story on both uh, street frontages. Next slide. The proposed development's ground floor would contain around 12,000 square feet of manufacturing use to be utilized by the applicant for its water tank pipe manufacturing, feeding, and storage business, which falls under use groups 16A and 17A. It would also contain about 5,500 square feet of local retail divided into three spaces. The proposed manufacturing use would have frontage on Crescent Street and 27th Street with a loading berth and a 12 foot wide carb cut on Crescent Street. This single loading berth uh, would replace six loading berths currently, currently present on the property. The proposed development would reduce the number of carb cuts at the development site from five to two 12 foot wide carb cuts, one along Crescent Street and a second one on 27th Street accessing the proposed developments below grade parking facility. Next slide. The through lot portion of the development site would have a 60 foot rear yard equivalent with a permitted single story of commercial manufacturing space that would cover part of the yard. The interior lot portion of the development site would have a required 30 foot rear yard that would also have a permitted single story of commercial manufacturing space. A cellar parking facility would provide 88 required accessory res residential parking spaces, 18 required commercial parking spaces, and 12 required manufacturing parking spaces for a total of 118 spaces. Next slide. To facilitate the development, uh, the, the applicant proposes a zoning map amendment from an existing M12 R5B and M12 R5D zoning districts to an M12 R6A zoning district and a zoning text amendment to enable mandatory inclusionary housing provisions within the special Long Island City mixed use district and the Dutch scale sub district and modify appendix F of the zoning resolution to establish a mandatory inclusionary housing area. 
Uh, next slide, please. The proposed zoning map amendment would rezone the project area from an existing M12 R5D and M12 R5B district to an M12 R6A zoning district within the subdistrict, representing an extension of the existing M12 R6A district directly south of the project area. Despite the proposed increase in density, the, the project uh, area's proposed district would continue to serve as a transition regarding density and height between higher density blocks to the south and the adjacent lower density districts to the north. The proposed zoning map amendment would allow the development site to be improved with residential uses, provide a new ground floor retail to activate this section of Crescent Street, and would allow the applicant's business to retain a presence in Long Island City, as well as retain the, the existing jobs on the site by modernizing their facilities at this location for their operations. Next slide, please. The proposed map and zoning text amendment would enable and establish mandatory inclusionary housing in the special Long Island City mixed use district and the Dutch scale sub district and will ensure new developments within the project area contain affordable housing. The applicant is proposing MIH option one, which would require 25% of residential floor area to be affordable at an average of 60% median area medium income. This would align with the overall special uh, district's purpose of supporting the and continuing growth of mixed residential, commercial, and industrial neighborhoods by permitting the expansion and development of residential, commercial, and light manufacturing uses, encouraging the development of affordable housing, and promoting and retaining jobs within Long Island City. Next slide, please. In conclusion, this is a private application by Crescent Street Associates, LLC, for a, rezoning, for a zoning map amendment from an existing M12 R5B and M12 R5D zoning districts to an M12 R6A district and related zoning tax amendment to enable and establish mandatory inclusionary housing provisions within the special Long Island City mixed use district and the Dutch Kill sub district to facilitate the development of a 175,000 square foot seven story mixed use building containing 233 dwelling units including 60 affordable units and 17,000 square feet of commercial and light, manufacturing, light industrial uh, floor area at 4025 Crescent Street in Dutch Kills, Queens, Community District 1. Um, this concludes my presentation and I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you very much, Luis. Um, I, let me start off uh, with, with one question. I, I understand that this project is in both the Long Island City Mixed Use District and the Fresh Kills uh, Special Subdistrict, correct? The Dutch Kills Subdistrict, yes. I'm sorry, yes, good. The Dutch Kills sub Subdistrict. Um, so, the just let's talk about the interaction between those two districts. You described one of them, maybe it's both of them. I just want to make sure I have it straight as having a goal of preserving light manufacturing uh, while encouraging residential and affordable housing. Um, is that the print? Is that the the Dutch Kills subdistrict, or is that the Long Island City mixed use district, or is it, uh, or you know, or it, is it uh, is one uh, subsumed within the other? Yes. So the the Dutch Kills subdistrict is within the uh, uh, Long Island uh, the special Long Island City mixed use district. So the uh, Dutch Kills of district was established in 2008. And the purpose of the uh, Dutch Kills of district was to um, uh, retain the manufacturing uses and jobs existing in the area while also promoting affordable housing and the development of contextual um, residential buildings within the sub districts. So these are the purposes of, um, part of the purpose of, of the uh, sub district within the um, special and Island city district. And there is <clears throat> FAR that is, a, that is a bonusable here for industrial uses. Can you say a little bit more about that? Yes, so um, there is a bonus for, um, uh, by keeping um, industrial uses within the sites, um, there is certain buttons that uh, applicants can obtain. Um, this is to obviously promote the um, promote 
keeping these uses within the subdistrict and the jobs that are currently existing there. It, is this, is 4025 Preston Street, is it taking advantage of one of those bonuses for um, the industrial use or is that where, where they are? I, I think they are taking advantage of, uh, because they're keeping the manufacturing use within their, their site. Okay. Um, I, just to clarify this slightly, we are mapping a new R6A here. While we're not necessarily creating the same type of mechanism, the proposal here doesn't in fact embody the type of project that the existing sub-district tax tries to encourage the development of. But this particular site does not rely upon a bonus structure in the same way. We're creating actually much more straightforward zoning with the application of the R6A here, but by virtue of the proposal that they've designed here, it is still in keeping with the spirit and the goals of the subdistrict. Right. Okay. So, um, okay. Can you explain, uh, Alexis, why why we would do it that way, or why the applicant would do it that way, as opposed to within the subdistrict? I'm sure there's. A very simple answer to this question, but I, I'm not sure that I understand completely. It's keeping in it's um, keeping within the, I mean, in, in, the values. It's keeping within the values of the subdistrict. You're saying, but it, it but it's zoning it differently. Explain that for us. Certainly, I mean, in this case, it's really using zoning in its more direct form. It's more off the shelves, so. Typically, a special purpose district, it can create new rules that sort of supersede the standard off the shelf zoning. Um, in, in this sub district, it was seen that it would be advantageous to create an incentivized zoning structure for some of the lower densities to ensure that there wasn't a whole cloth displacement of manufacturing and light industrial uses within the area. In this case, we had a private applicant coming to us and their project was seeking a slightly higher density, but they were also already planning to have that type of use included. And so it wasn't seen as necessary to be creating an incentive structure um, for, for this zoning in this case. But again, it is still consistent with the goals that the lower density incentives established. Okay. Got it. I, I just flagged this one because there's so much conversation that we frequently have about manufacturing zones and the need for the creation of residential. Uh, and this is a subdistrict which was created in 2008 with that very, very specific goal of promoting and retaining manufacturing uses while also creating um, residential housing, affordable housing. Um, and so I think, you know, I, I'm, I'm, I'm taking a close look at this one for the obvious reasons, because there's a lot of districts around the city that are talking about both preserving light manufacturing and also creating affordable housing. So this, you know, if successful, becomes a very, very interesting one, one of perhaps several interesting and useful precedents for us, but, a, but an important one. Um, OK, so let me um, let me see if there are other questions here. Okay, um, Luis, thank you. Alexis, thank you. Thank you. Uh, with that, uh, 4025 Preston Street is certified and we will move on uh, to the next item. Ryan? Sure. Uh, the sixth item on our agenda is a certification of a zoning map amendment in Queens Community District 8. Our presenter is Scott Solomon. Good afternoon, commissioners. I just want to test audio. Yep, we can hear Great. you. Great. Uh, you can move on to the next slide. So this is a private application by Dr. Mikhail Cantius uh, seeking a zoning map amendment that would facilitate a legalization of an existing non-conforming medical laboratory at 7918 164th Street in the Hillcrest neighborhood of Queens Community District 8. Next slide. The project area is oriented on the uh, southwest intersection of Union Turnpike and 164th Street. 
162nd Street, the western boundary, and the southern end of the project area, area lining up with 81st Avenue. The surrounding area primarily consists of low-rise residential, commercial, and mixed-use buildings fronting the southern side of Union Turnpike, a 100-foot wide street that serves as a primary east-west thoroughfare and commercial corridors, and 164th uh, Street, a 120-foot wide street that also serves as a major uh, north-south thoroughfare. Uh, one of the outliers of this density is a seven-story residential building on the north side of Union Turnpike, and the uses along the side streets off of Union Turnpike are predominantly one and two family homes. The project area is served by several local and express bus routes with stops located along uh, both Union Turnpike and 164th Street. Routes on 164th Street provide a 13-minute bus ride to the Parsons Boulevard subway station approximately three-quarters of a mile to the south. Uh, next slide. And you can actually move on to the slide following that because it's redundant. So the surrounding area includes low density residential zoning districts, include the project area uh, along with commercial overlay districts mapped along Union Turnpike. The entirety of the project area is within a C13 commercial overlay. The lots that front Union Turnpike uh, within an R5D district and the lots fronting 164th Street uh, within a R4 district. C1 commercial overlays are found uh, throughout the city's lower and medium density areas and allow typical local retail and service uses. Uh, commercial and community facility FAR rules for C13 commercial overlays range from 0.5 to 2, depending on the mix of uses. R4 and R5D districts permit a residential FAR of 0.75 and 2, respectively. All commercial and community facility uses other than the development site are conforming uses. However, the development site uh, includes a non-conforming second story medical lab as discussed, not allowed in a C13 district. And this has been operating continuously since 1989, uh, ever since in a non-conforming status. Next slide. Compared to the previous, oh, I'm sorry, yeah, I can go back one slide. So I, I just wanna note that compared to the, the previous area met this uh, larger scale aerial is uh, uh, rotated slightly. And so we're now looking uh, northwest into the project area. Uh, and this includes a portion or entirety of 12 tax lots. The proposed development site outlined in red and fronting 164th Street is a 4,000 square foot interior lot currently approved with that non-conforming uh, two-story building. And that has a medical office on the ground floor and the medical lab on the second story. Uh, the remaining lots include low and medium rise mixed use commercial community facility buildings, in addition to the portions of three lots with single family attached and detached homes. Next slide. So the first photo is a view of the development site facing northwest from 164th Street. Again, uh, the ground floor medical office and the medical laboratory is located on the second story. Next slide. The second photo is a northwest view of 164th Street uh, frontage. Uh, from left to right is a, an attached single family home, partially within the project area, uh, followed by a two story office building, a laundromat, house of worship, the development site, and then a dentist office. Next slide. And then this final photo catches up at that corner, uh, southwest view of the corner lot building, which consists of a variety of uses, including medical and professional offices, restaurants, an adult trade school, and a gym. The balance of the project area along Union Turnpike in the background are two mixed use buildings with ground floor commercial uses with residential above uh, before we approach 162nd Street, a 60 foot narrow street. Next slide. Uh, so back to the uh, existing conditions photo, the applicant is not seeking to facilitate any additional bulk or use changes from the existing conditions at the development site. Uh, applicant has stated that when he closed on the property in 1989, he was unaware of the non-conforming issue. And upon discovering this, decided to pursue the rezoning to remedy the non-conformity. The facility is a, a pathology lab that analyzes tissue samples that are sent in from other off-site medical uh, practices. Uh, facilities lim limited to 10 employees, including the applicant, and patients do not come into the office. Uh, first floor is a tenant of the applicant and is a medical office affiliated with Queens Hospital Center. Next slide. 
So to facilitate the legalization, the applicant proposes a remap amendment to rezone the existing C-13 overlay to a C-23 overlay without changing the underlying low-scale residential districts. The proposed map amendment would maintain the 100-foot depths of the existing zoning districts, fronting Union Turnpike and 164th Street, and the proposed C-23 commercial overlay would maintain the same commercial community, community facility bulk regulations of the existing C-13. However, the medical lab would be brought into conformity and the C2, C2 district would permit a slightly wider range of uses such as repair facilities and health and fitness establishments without a square footage limit uh, that exists in the C1 district. Next and final slide. So in conclusion, per the applicant, the land use rationale is to reinforce the existing low rise mixed use character of the surrounding area, modestly expand the range of permitted uses and to provide a stable zoning predictability to the subject properties, which includes several small businesses and community facility uses. That concludes the presentation and happy to answer any questions. Great, thanks, Scott. Um, this, this one looks pretty straightforward to me, so I don't, I don't have any questions. Let me see if others do. Okay, looks like it's straightforward to everybody. Thank you, Scott. We appreciate it. This one is certified. Great. Thank, Thank you. you. And we'll move on to the next one, uh, Ryan. Yep, the, we're moving on to pre-hearings. So the seventh item on our agenda is a pre-hearing review, zoning map and zoning text amendments in Queens Community District 8. Uh, Scott Solomon, Solomon will present this as well. Scott. Uh, and good afternoon again, commissioners. Uh, we can move on to the next slide. So this is a private application by VP Capital Holdings LLC, uh, proposing a zoning map amendment and corresponding text amendment and to facilitate development of an eight story mixed use building containing 119 dwelling units, 36 permanently affordable at 7739 Blight Place in the Kew Garden Hills neighborhood of Queens Community District 8. Uh, this application was certified on January 18th, 2022. Come back for hearing on Wednesday. Next slide. The project area is located a quarter mile north east of the Kew Gardens Interchange. It's a major junction that provides access to major roads and highways, and which also divides the communities of Kew Garden Hills, Kew Gardens, Briarwood, and Forest Hills. Next slide. The surrounding area is predominantly developed with a mix of three-story walk-up apartment buildings to the north, south, and east, and single-family detached homes to the southwest. The project area is within a three two, excuse me, R32 C12 district and the C12 overlay extending across the street. The project area is served by several bus lines, including local and select bus service routes that run along Main Street to the east and Union Turnpike to the south. And the Kew Garden subway station with access to the E and F lines are about a 20 minute walk or 10 minute bus ride to the Southwest. Next slide. Uh, looking Northeast into the project area, the primary built context of the three uh, are th these three story multifamily residences to the North, East and South. Uh, immediately across from the development side of Light Place is a pre-K facility and the block East is Main Street uh, in addition to Vlight Place, a wide street, the confluence of the street, the several streets here creates a relatively wide intersection, portions over 160 feet wide, which leads to uh, the open air and light provided by a public playground further to the south. The project area consists of approximately 40,000 square feet. The project area is bounded by Vlight Place to the west, a 79 foot wide street, 77th Road to the north, and 77th, excuse me, 78th Avenue to the south. The development site is located on lot one, a corner lot consisting of approximately 35,000 square feet. In 2016, a fire had destroyed a, a one-story commercial building that had included 13 local retail businesses. The site is currently vacant, but the applicant has been constructing an as a right commercial building here to both prevent damage to the excavated site, but also to be able to provide a building should the ap subject application uh, not move forward. The remaining lot in the project area 15 is a 50,000 square foot interior lot that includes a three-story multifamily apartment building. However, only a 5,000 square foot triangular portion that contains accessory parking garages are within the rezoning area. Next slide. 
So photo one of two is a view of the developments site from the intersection of 78th Avenue and Fly Place, the public park would be behind us. Uh, the photo reflects a period when the applicant was excavating the property. Uh, however, this site now has been filled in with two stories from an as of right DOB application. The applicant, uh, should the application be approved, is prepared to refile and add the additional bulk without seeking a new foundation. And then next slide. And then photo two is a view of the light place facing north from 78th Avenue, development site to the right, private school on the left. Next slide. In terms of the proposed development, the applicant is proposing to build an eight-story, 189,000 square foot mixed-use building, including 119 dwelling units and 18,000 square feet of ground floor community facility and commercial space. Following the loss of the 13 businesses described earlier, this would bring back a significant amount of lost retail space currently proposed as four commercial units and one community facility space. The applicant does not have specific tenants arranged. However, the applicant envisions uh, similar uses to the previous local retail, in addition to the potential for medical uses or a child care facility, which is in high demand for this particular area. 36 of the units would be permanently affordable pursuant to MIH option two, although both options one and two are proposed. 126 attended parking spaces, excuse me, both options one and two would be mapped. Uh, 126 parking spaces would be located in the subcellar and space for 60 bicycles in the cellar. Uh, applicant is also proposing to provide approximately 15,000 square feet of outdoor and interior recreational space. This is beyond the 3,700 square feet that would be required for zoning. Next slide. Above here is a illustrative rendering looking into the Vlive Place frontage looking southeast. The proposed building would have a maximum height of 85 feet, it includes a five-story base, including permitted dormers and all street frontages. And then you can see outdoor space amenities on the sixth floor and roof of the seventh and eighth floors. Additionally, there's a second floor terrace in the rear occupying the void between building portions. Next slide. To facilitate the proposed development, the applicant proposed a zoning map amendment from R32C12 to R6A, C23, and R32. Essentially, in addition to mapping R6A coterminous with lot one, the commercial overlay is being changed to C23 and then reduced in depth to only cover lot one. Uh, this would allow for a maximum residential FAR of 3.6 for inclusionary housing areas and three for community facility uses. The C23 overlay would allow a commercial FAR of two, reduce commercial parking requirements, and the reduced depth of the overlay is intended to prevent any commercial intrusion further east. Next slide. And then here is the corresponding text amendment to map MIH coterminously, coterminously with the rezoning area, mapping options one and two, but intending to utilize option uh, two only. Uh, this would result in 36 permanently affordable units. Option two requires that at least 30% of the residential floor area be provided as housing permanently affordable to households with incomes at an average of 80% of the area median income, which is 85,000 approximately for a family of three. Uh, for context, the AMI levels for CB8 is 69,000, for the smaller Kew Garden Hills area, 73,000, and for the larger New York City area, 63,000. Next slide. The following certification, Community Board 8 uh, voted to disapprove the application by a vote of 18 to 12, with a condition that union labor be used for the construction uh, and maintenance of the building. During the hearing, the primary concerns expressed were the impact on traffic, the height of the building, and the potential change to the neighborhood character. Uh, those in support noted the need for both market rate and affordable units, uh, the transit-rich resources, the need to fill the void of the lack of local retail, and those who discussed the need for housing, several specifically testified the need for lower co cost housing for young families and empty nesters and other seniors who want to downsize but stay in the neighborhood. Uh, the applicant addressed uh, community concerns with a letter sent to the, D to the community board after the public hearing that summarized their commitments, which is included in your briefing package. Uh, next slide. And the following uh, CB review, Queensboro president similar recommended to disapprove the application with conditions uh, shown on the screen, echoing the concerns of the CB, uh, with the primary stipulation being to change the proposed zoning district to R6B, 
and to which would lead to the reduction in height and density. Uh, next slide. Uh, so in conclusion, according to the applicant, the land use rationale relates to bringing much needed housing production, including affordable units to an underutilized site that fronts a wide street to focus the density along the live place and to, is proximate to bus transit and the commercial overlay would permit a wider range of local commercial and community facility uses that would serve the surrounding area, reduce onerous co commercial parking requirements, and then re reduce the depth of the overlay so not to intrude to the mid-block. Uh, that concludes the presentation. I'm happy to answer any questions. Thanks. Thanks very much. Um, so my, my only question here is about, um, I guess it relates, Scott, to the borough president's recommendation um, of the possibility of doing R6B instead of R6A. And it really relates to the, the height and context of the buildings here in this neighborhood. You had noted that uh, the area is predominantly three-story walk-ups and single families, I think with a pre-K across the street. And that looks like a pretty wide intersection. So it looks like it could handle some density right there. Um, but how far are we? This is an eight-story building. Um, how far is this? Eight story uh, would be allowed. That's exciting. Say, I'm sorry. Say that again. So uh, yes, it is. Uh, they're proposing an eight story building in our yeah. society. I didn't mean to put yes. it out there. Right. Okay. So the the question that I have is put it in context for us with the with the surrounding area. I mean, you showed us the image, um, mm -hmm. uh, and you know. I see the borough president's recommendation on R6B, presumably, and with a, I think he had a, a, an example here of, that would be 55, that would, I guess that would be uh, 55 feet high as opposed to perhaps what, whatever the applicant is, is requesting. So tell us more about this in the context of the surrounding neighborhood and in the presence of a wide intersection and why this is, possibly okay as proposed, as opposed to a potential concern uh, in the neighborhood for, uh, for context. Sure, so, uh, so I would start off first with, noting again, the, the wide street, you know, R6A are, are oftentimes mapped uh, when they are located proximate or adjacent to the wide streets. That is one of the primary reasons. Uh, the proximity to the bus transit access is, is a major reason for the, the rationale. Uh, and although it, the most immediate buildings are three-story uh, uh, multifamily buildings uh, and single-family detachments further south, uh, it is, you know, the, the site has been underutilized for quite some time and it presents an opportunity for uh, additional housing production to meet the need for housing in the area. Uh, it's uh, primarily the confluence of these wide streets uh, in proximity to transit is the primary goal here. And the context uh, uh, is still multifamily um, and at a lower uh, density or floor area, um, but R6A is often viewed as being appropriate for this type of wide streets. And, and additionally, it is certainly the priority that, of the department in the city to see affordable housing assets delivered across the city um, this is certainly a district that hasn't seen significant affordable housing. This will be one of only one or two, Scott, correct me if I'm wrong, MIH mappings within this district. Um, and so, you know, again, the fact that this is a neighborhood that is proximate to transit and has a lot of access to good community serving um, uses is, is certainly a strong reason in our eyes as to why this is appropriate for affordable housing. Okay, got it, thank you. Uh, let's see if there are other questions here. Commissioner Rampershad. Uh, thank you, uh, thank you, Scott. Um, Chair Gowalnik actually asked one of the questions I had, which was in regards to the borough president's comment about going from R6A to R6B. But I'm looking at the letter that was uh, dated from the applicant to the in response to the community board, and they were talking about increasing the number of um, on the two bedroom apartments. What was that number increased to? Uh, 
So yeah, the applicant is committed to increasing the mix. I don't have the exact figure breakdown. Um, the applicant will address that. Uh, uh, my understanding is it won't reduce the total number of uh, the total number of 119 dwelling units, um, but it will probably pull down from other units. But one of the primary, not primary, but one of the issues that came up was community asking for more family friendly uh, units, uh, primarily two units, and that is where they're trying to find opportunity to increase that mix. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner. Commissioner Levin. Uh, yes, thank you, Scott. I see that um, in the letter that Commissioner Rumpershaw just referred to, the applicant has also committed to a building structure of only six stories as opposed to eight stories. And I gather that was presented at the community oh. board. Um, how should we be thinking about that for the public hearing? Obviously that's a commitment apparently made to the community, which will be very important um, that the applicant uphold, but we're being asked simply to map the zoning, right? So we're looking at an eight story building, even if the applicant um, follows through on their commitment and actually builds something less. So, help us understand how we should look at the eight story versus the six story. And maybe I hope the applicant should at least show us what the six story and tell us about the six story um, uh, possibility because that's something that they've prevent, presented to the community. Sure. So yeah, the, during the community board meeting, uh, the applicant committed to uh, uh, exploring a way to reduce the height artificially, but they do advocate and they stand by the R6A as appropriate. Uh, we've seen other applications where the department has stood by and R6A is appropriate density here. And the applicant intends to present R6A as the most appropriate density here, but also acknowledging that, uh, uh, that there has been concerns from the community that they express a commitment to a lower height, um, but not with changing the underlying district. Uh, and they are prepared to show an alternative R6B and that how that will impact the, the change of unit count. It will bring it down from approximately 119 dwelling units to approximately uh, eight between I think 80 to 90 dwelling units uh, and then uh, subsequent reduction in mandatory inclusionary housing units as well. Yeah. Uh, so they're prepared to show a side-by-side -side, uh, scenario here, but still advocating that R6A being the most appropriate for the commission to consider. Okay, good, thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Levin. Okay, Scott, thank you very much. We appreciate it. And this item is going to go over to a public hearing on Wednesday. So we will uh, look forward to hearing from the applicant team on Wednesday, the 11th. Uh, thank you, Scott, for everything. And we're going to move on to our next uh, pre-hearing also in Queens. That's right. The eighth item on our agenda, a pre-hearing review of the zoning map and zoning text amendment uh, in Community District 1 in Queens. And Joy Razor is our presenter. I will note that Commissioner Rampashad is recused on this item. Great, thank you, thank Ryan. You, Ryan. Uh, good afternoon, commissioners. Next slide. This application is returning to the commission after it was certified on February 14th, and the public hearing will be held on Wednesday. This is an application by JPP 33rd Street LLC and Lily and John Realty for a series of land use actions including a zoning map amendment to change an R5 district to an M15 R6A mixed use district, a zoning text amendment to establish a mandatory inclusionary housing area, and a zoning text amendment to amend zoning resolution article 12 chapter three to establish a mixed use district MX23 and M15 R6A district with a maximum base height of 75 feet and a maximum building height of 95 feet. The actions would facilitate an approximately half million square foot mixed use development comprised of two eight story buildings with 352 dwelling units, including between 88 and 105 permanently affordable units and approximately 150,000 square feet of commercial and light industrial uses in Northwest Ravenswood, Queens, Community District 1. Next slide. Ravenswood is situated just north of Long Island City, south of Astoria and east of Roosevelt Island, along the East River waterfront. 
Ravenswood historically has served as a transitional mixed use area between the Long Island City IBC, south of 36th Avenue, and more residential Astoria neighborhoods north of Broadway. This area is also well served by transit, including the Q104 and Q103 bus lines and the N, W, and F lines. In addition, the Astoria stop on the New York City Ferry is located approximately a half mile north on Halix Peninsula. Given the area's strategic location, development interest has increased in recent years, including a cluster of private applications highlighted in pink and blue, with this private application being number two on the map. As a result of private development interest, the community requested a cohesive vision for the neighborhood, and the department developed the Ravenswood framework for the area in 2019. The framework leverages Ravenswood historic industrial character in proximity to growing job clusters in the arts, healthcare, tech, and life sciences to create opportunities for new mixed use development with community serving job uses and affordable housing. Next slide. Here's a land use map of the project area and the surrounding area, which includes a wide mix of residential, commercial, light industrial, community facility, and park uses. Retail is concentrated along Broadway, two blocks north of the project area, which also serves as the boundary between the more residential Astoria neighborhood to the north and more mixed use and industrial Ravenswood neighborhood to the south. The New York City Housing Authority Ravenswood Houses is located directly southeast of the project area, and the surrounding area is predominantly mapped with non-contextual residential districts to the south, west, uh, south and west, and low and mid-density contextual zoning districts to the north and east. Recent land use actions in the area include the 2019 Vernon Boulevard Broadway rezoning and the 2021 Broadway and 11th Street rezoning. Next slide. The project area consists of the entirety of Block 318, which includes five contiguous tax lots that have a combined lot area of approximately 110 square feet. The project has frontage on two wide streets, 11th Street and 34th Avenue, and two narrow streets, 12th Street and 33rd Road. The project area includes two development sites. Development site one, which consists of blocks Block 318, lots 15 and 22 on the northern portion of the block. And this is approximately 50, 57,000 square feet with frontage on 11th Street, 12th Street and 33rd Road. And is currently improved with a one story food production and distribution building. Development site two consists of block 318, lot one on the majority of the southern portion of the block and is approximately 40,000 square feet. It's currently improved with a three-story, 50-foot tall building along 12th and 34th Avenue and a one-story warehouse mid-block on 12th Street, along with a one-story warehouse on 34th Avenue. These buildings are occupied currently by auto repair and office uses. There are also two non-applicant controlled sites in the project area, lots nine and 11. Lot nine is improved by a two-story, two-family apartment building and lot 11 by a one-story building occupied by auto repair uses. Next slide, please. Here you can see a view of development site one looking south from 33rd Road and 11th Street. Next slide. And here you can see a view of development site two at the opposite corner of the project area looking north from 34th Avenue and 12th Street. Next slide. The actions would facilitate an approximately half a million square foot mixed use development comprised of two eight story buildings with 352 dwelling units, including between 88 to 105 permanently affordable units and 150,000 square feet of commercial and light industrial uses. Development site one on the Northern portion of the block would contain an eight story mixed use building totaling approximately five FAR containing 204 units, including 51 to 61 MIH units. It would also contain approximately 90,000 square feet of commercial and light industrial floor area, including local retail, two trade schools, artist studio space, 
and office space. Development site two on the southern portion of the block would contain an eight story mixed use building totaling approximately five FAR containing 140 residential units, including 37 to 44 MIH units. It would also contain approximately 60,000 square feet of light industrial and commercial floor area, including local retail, a food distributor, commercial facility uses, and office space. Next slide. To facilitate the development, the applicant is proposing two actions, which include a zoning map amendment to change an R5 district to an M15 R6A mixed use district, and a zoning text amendment to Appendix F to establish an MIH area and to establish a mixed use M15 R6A district with a maximum base height of 75 feet and a maximum building height of 95 feet. Next slide. The applicant proposes a zoning math amendment to rezone the project area full tax block from R5 to M15 R6A. The transition from an R5 district to an M15 R6A district would promote a mixed use development with affordable housing and job growth on an underutilized property. The proposed M15 R6A district would permit new mixed use development with a maximum residential FAR of 3.6 and a maximum, and maximum commercial and manufacturing FARs of 5.0. While R6A districts typically permit a base height of between 40 and 65 feet and a maximum building height of 80 or 85 feet with a qualifying ground floor and MIH areas, the proposed text amendment would increase the base and maximum heights to permit a base height of between 40 and 75 feet with a maximum building height of 90 feet or 95 feet with a qualifying ground floor and MIH areas. The R6A density reflects the medium density residential context on the west side of 11th Street, while the corresponding R7A bulk envelope better accommodates the significant amount of non-residential use being proposed on site by addressing the constraints of the R6A and the M15 building envelopes, which would limit the floor to floor heights of the non-residential uses. Next slide. The applicant proposes a text amendment to establish an MIH area highlighted by the red arrow on the map. The applicants are proposing MIH options one and two. Option one requires that 25% of the residential floor area be made permanently affordable at an average of 60% AMI. Option two requires that 30% of the residential floor area be made permanently affordable at an average of 80% AMI. For context, Community District 1 has a median household income of around $64,000, uh, which is approximately 55% AMI for a family of three. Next slide. On March 15th, Queens Community Board 1 held a split vote on the application with 15 in favor, 15 opposed, and two abstaining. While there were no conditions for the vote, they provided recommendations to include a larger share of two and three bedroom units to better serve families in the community, as well as more and deeper affordability of the MIH units. Next slide. On April 7th, the Queensboro president held a public hearing for the project and provided a recommendation to approve the application with conditions related to local hiring and MWBE commitments. Um, incentives for providing affordable spaces for local artists, expanded outreach to the community, local organizations, and NYCHA houses about the project and related job opportunities, and a commitment to deeper and more affordability with respect to the MIH units. Next slide. In summary, this is an application by JPP 33rd Street LLC and Lillian John Realty for a zoning math amendment and a zoning text amendment to facilitate the development of an approximately half million square foot mixed use development comprised of two eight story buildings with 352 dwelling units, including between 88 to 105 permanently affordable units and approximately 150,000 square feet of commercial and light industrial uses in Ravenswood, Queens Community District One. 
The applicant will be available Wednesday to answer any questions, uh, but I'm happy to answer you may have at this point. Thanks, Joy. Uh, recognizing that uh, this is a question that we should probably pose to the applicant, uh, uh, feel free to, to uh, just defer until then. But uh, there would need to be some relocation of existing businesses in the site. Do, does the applicant have a plan for that or have they articulated what they're going to do? Sure. Um, thanks for the question. My understanding is that most of the buildings within the project area are already vacant, but um, the remaining businesses have been notified and the applicant's working with uh, all of the related and existing businesses on a relocation plan. And they can definitely speak more to that. Okay, great, thank you. Um, okay, let me see what other questions we have. 15 to 15 at the community board, that doesn't happen every day. So, you know, we take note of that. Commissioner Bernie. Thank you very much. Uh, I just have one comment really about the um, facades of the building. It, it, it seems as though the applicant has made an attempt to use every possible available building material in finishing the building. And I just wonder whether they might not rethink it and try to calm it down a little bit and perhaps make it more consistent with the context in which they're building. If you could ask them that question, that'd be great. Absolutely. Thank you. Okay, let's see. Anybody else on this? Okay. Thanks, Joy. Thank you. Uh, we're going to bring this one to a public hearing on Wednesday. Uh, next up, uh, also in Queens, is a discussion of some NYPD office space, uh, 41 Summit Street. Ryan, do you uh, hope I didn't steal the thunder there? Uh, no, the, the, the item nine is a pre hearing review of uh, notice of intent to acquire office space in Queens Community District 6, and Hai Kang Yang will present this. Okay. Good afternoon, commissioners. Afternoon. Next slide. The Department of Citywide Administrative Services and the New York City Police Department seek to acquire approximately 13,000 square feet of office space and 10 parking spaces at 6920 Austin Street in Forest Hills, Queens Community District 6. These spaces are needed for the relocation of the NYPD Queens Special Victim Squad from their current location at the 112th Precinct as their current space is too small and poorly designed for the special unit's operation. Next slide, please. The proposed office space is located in an existing four-story commercial building in an R5D C23 zoning district within the Forest Hills Special District, which focuses on promoting a pedestrian-oriented commercial hub that serves the residents of Forest Hills and the surrounding area with a mix of shops and restaurants and minimize impacts on nearby residential areas. This location is well served by public transportation. The E, F, R, and M subway lines are all within a few blocks of the building, as well as the Q60 and several express buses. Next slide, please. The proposed office space highlighted in the pink on the right will be located 600 feet from its existing location at the 112th precinct, um, located in the yellow to the left. The proposed relocation is in response to the expanded operations of the NYPD Queens Special Victim Squad and the poorly designed existing office space that the unit is using within the existing precinct. It's poorly designed because it allows victims and suspects to see one another, which is contrary to the efforts to offer more victim-centric spaces. Next slide, please. The proposed relocation to 6920 Austin Street will provide the unit with private interview spaces, separate entrances and spaces for victims and suspects, and dedicated space for services from the affiliated community partners, such as the Queens District Attorney's Office, the Victim Advocacy Organization, Safe Horizons, and medical personnel. Next slide, please. In addition to the one floor of office space needed in the commercial building, the NYPD needs 10 parking spaces within the garage, which is located within the second and third floor of the building. Entrances for both the office space and the garage are located along Austin Street. To facilitate the acquisition of the office and garage space, DCAS and NYPD submit jointly the notice of intent to acquire office space pursuant to section 195 of the New York City Charter. Thank you, and that concludes my presentation. 
Great. Thank you very much. Um, I, I must say that the notion that uh, there would be space where suspects and victims uh, could see each other is clearly problematic. So this is a, this is a good advancement here. Um, okay, let me see if there are questions. All right, well, we are gonna take this one to a public hearing on Wednesday. So thank you very much for that. Uh, and uh, Ryan, are you, you in the mood for a new borough? Yes, we are moving on to the Brooklyn. We have a Brooklyn pre-hearing item uh, in Community District 6. This is for a zoning map amendment and Jonah Rogoff will present. Great, uh, good afternoon, commissioners. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Um, you can start on the next slide, please. Uh, so this is an application returning for pre-hearing by 41 Summit Street LLC for a zoning amendment from an M11 to an R6B zoning district to facilitate a four-story, 5,000 square foot residential building located in the Columbia Street waterfront neighborhood of Brooklyn in community district six. And just as a quick refresher, I mentioned this at uh, certification, um, but in 2019, there was a previous application at the site that proposed a higher density and larger project area, uh, which was modified by the CPC from R7A to R6A, and then subsequently withdrawn during the city council's review. This current application reflects a revised proposal by the same applicant with a more limited rezoning area and a lower scale R6B district. Next slide. In the bird's eye above, uh, you can see the a uh, mix of industrial, commercial, and residential uses in the surrounding area. And then the project area is in a dashed uh, light blue line. The subject block is predominantly residential, consisting of two to five story, uh, one and two family homes and multifamily walk-up buildings. Industrial uses are concentrated along Van Bunch Street to the west, which is also a gateway to the Red Hook neighborhood, uh, while Columbia Street to the east serves as a local retail corridor. The area is well served by the uh, by a few of public transit options. The F and G subway lines are approximately half a mile from the project area, while the B61 bus line providing access to downtown Brooklyn, Red Hook, and Park Slope has a couple of stops of less than a block away. Next slide. In the area map above, uh, you can see the blocks, uh, again, the predominantly residential character shown in the uh, yellow and light uh, orange shades, along with several nearby parks and open spaces shaded in green. The project area is nearly coterminous with the development site and consists of a mid-block portion of Summit Street between Van Brunt and Columbia Streets. The block's western portion is zoned M11, a manufacturing district that allows a maximum FAR of one for industrial and commercial uses and 2.4 for certain community facility uses. M11 permits a maximum base height of 30 feet with building height governed by the sky exposure plane. And then accessory off street parking is generally required for every 300 square feet of commercial and for every thousand square feet of industrial. Uh, just a quick note that the surrounding area has been subject to several uh, recent land use actions, including the 2009 area-wide rezoning of Carroll Gardens in the Columbia Street waterfront, which mapped contextual residential districts, uh, which you can see here, R6B and R6A, uh, with the primary goal to maintain the neighborhood's low-rise character. Uh, subsequently, there have been two private applications, the 20-30 Carroll Street application approved in 2011 and the 55-63 Summit Street application approved in 2019 that rezoned portions of the block from M11 to R6B also to uh, facilitate uh, new residential developments. Next slide. And just a quick view of, with, of the uh, flood zone uh, map above, you can see that uh, the area is just outside of the 1% annual chance floodplain and within the 0.2% annual chance floodplain, also known as the 500 year floodplain, uh, which has a low, lower uh, risk of coastal flooding. Next slide. And to briefly walk through the project area and its context, 
On the left is a view of the development site and the adjacent lots. And then on the right is a close up view of the site, uh, which occupies only a 25 feet of frontage on a 2,500 square foot lot improved with a two story former industrial building that has been vacant for uh, several years. Next slide. The applicant proposes a four story, 5,000 square foot residential building totaling two FAR and consisting of four units with a building height of 40 feet and no setback. Uh, no parking is proposed as the development would waive out of the off-street parking requirement. Next slide. To facilitate the proposal, the applicant requests a zoning map amendment from an M11 to an R6B zoning district, which would extend the existing R6B district over the development site and a sliver portion of the adjacent lot. R6B is a contextual residential district that allows a maximum of two FAR for residential and community facility uses. Base heights between 30 and 40 feet and building heights up to a maximum of 50 feet, which can be increased by five feet with a qualifying ground floor. Off street parking is generally required for 50% of the, of the dwelling units and then waived if five or fewer spaces are required. On this slide, I also want to quickly note again that the applicant is not requesting a zoning text amendment to map a mandatory inclusionary housing area as the increase in residential capacity from the zoning map change is very limited and would result in a development far below the threshold to comply with MIH. Next slide. And to quickly summarize the public review. Uh, on March 9th, Community Board 6 voted nearly unanimously, 28 in favor, one opposed, and one abstaining to approve the application with no conditions. And then on April 27th, the borough president submitted a recommendation to disapprove the application with no conditions, uh, mainly expressing concerns about the incremental nature of rezonings on the block that have been encroaching on uh, existing manufacturing districts. And with that, I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you. Great, thanks, Shono. The, um, just, I think one for me, you, you noted that there had been a previous application on the site, a higher density proposal that was uh, modified by the commission, I believe, and then withdrawn. Uh, what, what was that, what was different about that proposal? And can you, can you put that, this into that context for us? Absolutely. Thanks for that question. So the original proposal was for an R78 district, which have, would, would have allowed up to a, uh, I believe a six story building um, because partly the height would be limited because of um, when you're adjacent to an R6B district, um, there's a transition that limits the height. Um, and then during the CPC's review, uh, the CPC modified the application uh, from R7A to R6A, uh, which would which reduce the height by another story. Um, so it's, I believe it was a five-story development. Does that answer your question? I'm happy to go into more. Yeah, and now and now it's uh, now it's four. It's now it's four stories. Correct. Uh, R6B. So it was R7. It was proposed at R7A. Was modified to R6A um, at five stories. Now it's R six B with four stories. If I have it correctly, that's correct. And 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 just to one, uh, sorry, this is the deputy director of the Brooklyn office, Alex Summer. Uh, just also, the rezoning boundary was larger under the first application. It picked up the uh, a non applicant site as well, and this is a much smaller geography. Okay, great, thank you. Um, let's see if there are questions here. Commissioner Levitt. Um, yes, yeah, so the borough president's recommendation that this not be approved because we're doing things piecemeal. Um, it, it, am I correct that what we're really doing is making this entire area between Summit and Carroll uh, consistently in R6B? The, project area is just a small bite out of a larger block that is already R6B. And this is just bringing that one project site into the same zoning as 
the rest of that chunk. Am I right about that? That's right, Commissioner. Yeah, this is essentially okay. just extending the existing R6B district and the character um, yeah. further. So, so I, would, I would think that, the, the, in fact, you could argue that this is the opposite of piecemeal because it's making this area consistent, but it certainly has gotten there in a piecemeal fashion. So I guess I understand that portion. Well, no, I guess I don't understand anyway, but got it. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner. Okay, we will, uh, we will pick this one uh, back up on Wednesday uh, with the applicant. Thank you, Jonah, as always. Um, next up uh, is something a little bit different. Uh, uh, Ryan, do you wanna describe this next item? Sure, and, and this, there was a memo in the commissioner's package uh, regarding a resolution to enable the use of video conferencing to conduct commission meetings. Um, uh, the memo itself, uh, I think, explained all, all that we want to do. This is really uh, just to enable us or the commission to have uh, video, you know, the Zoom meetings continue after uh, June when uh, the executive order that allows us to have fully remote meetings uh, will expire. And so our general counsel is available if there are any questions, um, but this is well, just to schedule a hearing for this, which we have to do. Yeah, I, you know, I think, um, I'm sorry to do this to Susan, but I do wanna just make sure that, uh, like, let's just say it out loud, the things, because sure. I know that we all have it and I know what it is, but I just think for, for just one minute, it's worth uh, just explaining what we're talking about and what we intend to do. And then we can probably just proceed from there. So Susan, would you mind just uh, just a quick summary of what we're, what we're trying to do here? Uh, no, sure, absolutely happy to do that. Um, so the, uh, the complete remote authorization ends on June 8th, um, which happens to be a, um, a public hearing day. Um, and if we want to continue what um, the state has now allowed as a more limited um, ability to, uh, for commissioners uh, on occasion to join meetings remotely, um, we need to both uh, adopt a resolution that allows that, um, a commission, commission needs to adopt a resolution and they have to hold a public hearing on the resolution. So um, what, uh, the proposal is uh, is to have the hearing on the resolution in two weeks, and if the commission thereafter wants to adopt the resolution, they can. Um, and then starting really after January eighth, but that would be the review session that that takes place after that. June eighth. Uh, June eighth. I'm sorry, not January. January is a long time from now. Um, so. Um, it would be the review session that's, I think, on the 20th. Um, and at that point, the commission as a whole would need to be back uh, in person, holding uh, um, public meetings in, in person. Um, and But there will be an opportunity or an ability for an individual commissioner uh, if something comes up that's unexpected, or if there, you know, if the commissioner has something else, uh, even if expected, that prevents the commissioner from joining in person, uh, to be able to join remotely um, from whatever location the commissioner happens to be in. Um, there's some criteria that we have to do, some requirements um, in terms of, you know, noting that the commissioner is joining remotely. They're 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 fairly minor. Um, and then the public will also be able to, going forward, to continue to uh, join either in person or remotely, um, you know, using the same remote means we've been using really for the last year and a half at this point. So that, that's sort of it in a nutshell. And that authorization lasts for two years, um, which is what the state legislature has approved. And presumably, you know, in two years, it will be reassessed. Great, thank you, Susan. Let me go to Commissioner Cerullo for a question. And thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Susan. So really for all intents and purposes, we should be thinking of ourselves as back in person by the, is it the meeting of the 8th or the week of the 20th? 
It, it's the week of the 20th. So the meeting of the 8th is still a, a, a completely remote meeting. At, okay, so we, we really should be considering ourselves back in person the week of the 20th, recognizing that there, there is the ability to do remote under certain circumstances, obviously with notification as, as we might do if we were just going to be absent, um, but we could always log on if, if that's a possibility. The follow-up question is the determination of a quorum for our doing business is determined by those who are present in person or does it also count if you have people remotely logging on. So we have that, that so that's thanks for that question. The the quorum has to be present in person. Okay. So there always has to be a minimum of seven commissioners present in, person. in the hearing room in person. That's um, right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. I appreciate right. it. thank you. Thank you, Commissioner. Commissioner Levin. Yeah, and Susan, just to confirm, um, this has nothing to do with our ability to receive testimony remotely, right? I think we've learned um, how effective it can be um, to allow remote testimony. I think we've heard from a much wider, wider range of voices and in a um, nicely measured way that I hope we can, can, and I'm saying, I guess I understand this to be the case, but it's important for anyone watching this meeting to understand no changes for the public, right? You can that, show up in person or you can go on the NYC Engage portal. That, that's exactly right. We're gonna continue the, the public remote, um, <laughs> the ability for the public to join remotely as we've been doing um, through NYC Engage. And, and now when the commission is back in person, they'll also have the ability if they want to come in person uh, to the hearing room, but they, they will have the option. Um, and Giving up a day's work and traversing the city and doing all that. Exactly. Stuff. Right. I mean, yes, there's a lot of reasons why, why public members of the public may prefer to uh, join remotely. There are some reasons why members of the public might prefer right. to be in person and see the commissioners. Okay. But Thanks it for, is really there for clarifying that. Great. Uh, thank you, Commissioner. And thank you, Susan. Uh, we will uh, publish this in the uh, city record and, uh, Next up will be a, a hearing on this uh, this topic uh, before the commission. Uh, so thank you. Um, next, I want to uh, welcome to the uh, to the. Oh, I'm sorry. Wait, 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 Commissioner Goodridge. Did you wanna? Okay. It's probably better. I, I I. Well, okay, fine. I'll just ask. I was gonna say maybe I should just privately. Up. I'll just ask. What what if like in the in the off chance that. Um, you know, one of us is sick and um, we, with COVID or something else, but but not sick enough, but we can still appear virtually. We can, that's fine. Yeah, that that, that would be an, an absolutely fine reason to, for a commissioner to join remotely. Um, and so, yes, illness is, um, and, and contagious illness um, particularly is, 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 is a very good reason to join remotely. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Um, I want, next want to invite up uh, the executive director of uh, the Department of City Planning, uh, Edith Su Chen, who is gonna introduce a, um, a very exciting new concept that we believe is gonna uh, even better connect the work of the department to this commission. So Edith, the floor is yours. Thank you, Fernand. Hi, thank you. Um, it's a pleasure to speak with you today, commissioners, especially as I'm here to announce a new and important practice. So starting today, for projects that will be voted on by the CPC at the Wednesday meeting, DCP staff will state an official recommendation to the commission about whether we, the department, support an application and why. So this is a way to recognize one, the work of our professional planners and urban designers, uh, two, our public discussion with you commissioners, your questions, your recommendations, and very importantly, is to bring more transparency to the public about why we do or do not support a project, including what city policies are being advanced or not. Um, so of course, we as the city's planning professionals, um, St staff and advisors. We already do this in our exchanges with you during the public process. 
Um, but what we are introducing today is a discrete moment with the CPC in a meeting before the vote to help connect all the dots. So without further ado, I turn back to Ryan so we can launch this exciting new practice. Thank you. Thank you, Edith. Um, for, so for consideration on future votes, for consideration on May 11th, uh, staff have prepared uh, reports on the uh, in favor on the following, um, and I'll have, call up folks. So Resilient Edgemere Community Initiative, um, Alexis Wheeler is here with an update that will include a uh, discussion of, of the uh, department's uh, thing, but there's some other information too. So Alexis, why don't you take this away? Thank you so much, Ryan, and good afternoon again, commissioners. Um, ahead of Wednesday's vote for the Resilient Edgemere Community Plan, uh, DCP has been made aware that nine lots within the Urban Renewal Plan had not been properly noticed, and therefore the action would need to be modified. Um, next slide, please. And illustrated here in blue, you'll see the nine subject lots that we're talking about today. As part of the amendment to the Edgemere Urban Renewal Plan, acquisition authority would be reapplied to the existing lots within the urban renewal area, as well as to 13 additional lots comprised of four city owned lots and nine privately owned lots. City law requires notification to the owners of the property by mail prior to the community board and city planning commission hearings. However, partly due to discrepancies in Department of Finance's records for various property addresses, the nine owners out of the 117 lots that make up the future community land trust were not properly notified. HPD has submitted a letter to the commission requesting the application be modified to remove these nine lots and plan to file to, uh, a follow-up action in ULERP to then add these sites to the urban renewal plan um, and area in the future. Um, we do not have an exact date for when this follow-up ULERP action will occur, but HPD is currently determining that timeline and would anticipate that it will happen later this year at the earliest. Um, the good news is that it actually doesn't um, significantly affect some of the big plans that we have uh, for this area, including the community land trust, um, because after the designation of a community land trust provider by HPD, they will then enter into the first phase of the initiative, which will be the formal formation of the community land trust. And while HPD is not sure of the exact timing yet, they do anticipate going through the acquisition action prior to the second phase of the Community Land Trust Initiative, which is establishing a pre-development program. And so um, while you will all become very familiar with these sites and getting to review them yet again, um, the good news is that this doesn't hold up any of the larger area thinking and planning that um, we've all been doing together for this important resiliency plan. Um, and so I do just wanna see if there are any questions from commissioners about this particular subject before I continue? Questions? Alexis, you said this was nine of how many? What was the total? Out of 117 lots. Okay. Great, thank you. All right, keep going. Okay, great. Well, now I'm gonna step into the department's formal recommendation here. Happy to be doing this as um, an inaugural recommender. Um, DCP has prepared a report in favor of the proposed Resilient Edgemere Community Plan. Um, the plan will facilitate a holistic and forward-looking land use and development strategy for Edgemere that is responsive to the neighborhood's coastal flood risk and support its revitalization. The plan will limit future increases to the residential population of the areas most vulnerable to coastal flooding, support affordable home ownership opportunities through a community land trust, and result in 1,222 new residential units, including up to 465 affordable units, and uh, approximately um, 115,800 square feet of commercial and community facility space. 
The proposed actions were carefully tailored to be responsive to Edgemere's flood risk and result ongoing work by the city and the US Army Corps of Engineers to reduce flooding in the area. The creation of the special coastal risk district will limit future density along Edgemere's low-lying Jamaica Bay shoreline to reduce exposure to damage and disruption from coastal storms and sea level rise. The proposed zoning districts concentrate new affordable housing, retail, and community facility uses further inland near mass transit resources and along main east-west corridors that service the rest of the Rockaway Peninsula. The department recommends the commission vote in favor of the proposed actions for the resilient Edgemere community plan. Thank you very much, everyone. Thanks, Alexis. Very good. Thank you. Um, okay. Any questions? If not, we will move on to the next one. Right, so we have uh, 4541 Furman Avenue rezoning and Jutan is here to discuss the department's recommendation. Great, good afternoon. So regarding the 4541 Furman Avenue rezoning, the Bronx office believes the proposed R7D with MIH and the mapping of a C24 overlay along White Plains Road and the extension of the transit zone is appropriate. This rezoning is an extension of the R7D C24 district to the north that was rezoned in 2018. This rezoning would produce a mid-sized building containing 148 affordable units with 37 permanently affordable through the MIH text amendment on a site that currently has an unoccupied one-story warehouse. It would allow for a community facility use on Furman that is planned as a daycare. And the community commercial overlay would allow for ground floor commercial along White Plains Road, which would help further activate a stretch of White Plains Road that is only one block from two subway stops, one to the north, one to the south. The extension of the transit zone is also appropriate because of its proximity to the two subway stations. Uh, the, re the reason this block wasn't part of the original transit zone was because this block was a manufacturing district when the transit zone was originally enacted. The rezoning would also bring nine residential lots into conformance, allowing these owners the ability to obtain financing for renovations. For these reasons, the Bronx office believes the commission should support this proposal. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Jutan. Great. What's next? Uh, we have 3 East 89th Street, and Azka Mohanan is here uh, with some uh, further information. Azka? Good afternoon. Hello, Aska. Right. Uh, good afternoon, commissioners. This application by 3 East 89th Holding LLC for a special permit pursuant to section 74711 of the zoning resolution was presented to the City Planning Commission at the April 13th public hearing and is scheduled for a vote on Wednesday. Uh, at the last review session, the commission requested a response to the rest written testimony we received regarding this project. Next slide, please. One of the written correspondences received was on behalf of the residential building located at 1085th Avenue, highlighted here in yellow, on the west side of the development site outlined in the dash red line. The testimony opposed the proposed project for its potential effect on light and air to windows and the adjacent inner court located on the 1085th Avenue zoning lot, highlighted here in blue. Next slide. In their written testimony, the representative for 1085th Avenue claimed that there would be a substantial percentage loss in light in the courtyard. The figures on the screen were submitted as part of their testimony. The inner court has been highlighted for your reference, and according to the provided key, the blue represents the lower end of the scale of daylight. As you can see, the figure representing existing conditions on the right is not significantly different than the proposed conditions on the left, as the court gets very little light in the current circumstance. Next slide. Following the hearing, the applicant provided a written response to this testimony, which included screenshots of a New York Times interactive model, which mapped the shadows cast on every block and building in New York City. This model shows that the inner court is covered in shadow 100% of the time during the spring, fall, and winter months, and 90 to 90, 98% of the times during summer. Next slide. The applicant also submitted additional shadow studies of the court to contextualize the percentage loss in daylight that was presented in the written testimony. Based on an hourly study of the court on the summer solstice on June 21st, which is when the court would get the most light of the year, 
They found that most loss of light is limited to about two hours a day during 11 a.m. and 1 p.m. on the west side of the court. Next slide. This slide shows a change in light at 11 a.m. The west side of the court is outlined in blue and the area shaded in gray is in shadow. As you can see from the illustrations comparing the existing and proposed conditions, there is an incremental increase in shadow at the northeastern corner as a result of the proposed upper floor additions. Next slide. This slide shows the change in light at noon. The west side of the court is outlined in blue and the area shaded in gray is in shadow. As you can see from these illustrations comparing the existing and proposed conditions, there is an incremental increase in shadow at the northwestern corner as a result of the proposed upper floors. Next slide, please. The EAS, pursuant to the guidelines of the Seeker Technical Manual, includes a technical analysis on, in quantitative terms of shadows on publicly accessible sunlight sensitive resources, such as parks and historically significant features of landmark buildings. Separately, the finding in zoning resolution for a 74711 special permit calls for a more qualitative assessment to determine the modifications that would have minimal adverse effects on light and air on structures and open space in the vicinity. The existing buildings around the development site, including the 21 story building at 1085th Avenue and 38th story building at 45 East 89th Street, are much taller than the proposed six story development and already cast significant shadows on the area including the 1085th Avenue's court. Given these existing conditions and that the proposal is not physically encroaching into the court, the department believes their incremental increase in shadow will have minimal adverse effect on light and air to the 1085th Avenue's inner court, as well as structures and open spaces in the surrounding area. Next slide, please. The department also received testimony on behalf of the Carnegie Hill Neighbors Association, which claimed that the application was missing certain bulk waivers that are required due to the development site's proximity to the existing building at 1083 Fifth Avenue, highlighted here in yellow. Next slide, please. The written testimony claimed that the request waiver for a minimum distance between buildings on a single zoning lot for ZR section 23711 was not accurately calculated as, as should have been measured from the chimney shore here, shown here in yellow, located along the wall of 3 East 89th Street instead of the building wall. However, per the definition of building in the zoning resolution, smokestacks and similar structures are not included as part of a building and are not considered in measuring the required distance. Therefore, the calculation of the request waiver as rep represented in the application is accurate. Next slide, please. The written testimony also claimed that an additional waiver for minimum distance between buildings on a single zoning lot for ZR section 23711 was required to enable the addition of the second and third floors in the rear of the building. ZR section 23711 notes that abutting buildings on a single zoning lot may be considered a single, single building, so the distance between the buildings would apply to any level of the building above this abutment. 389th Street and 1083 Fifth Avenue were previously connected and abut on floors one through three in the area highlighted in yellow. Only the proposed additions on floors five and six will be subject to the distance between buildings waiver, which is included in the application. Next slide, please. The department believes the proposed development meets the findings of the special permit and the proposed use is consistent with the prevalent character of the area, which supports a mix of galleries, museums, and residential uses. 74711 special permit enables restoration and preservation to enhance the architectural and historical built fabric of the historic district. The department considers the project to be appropriate and recommends approval. I'm happy to take any questions. Great, thank you very much, Asuka. Let me see if there are questions. That light and air um, uh, diagrams I thought were very, uh, very clear and um, and helpful uh, and certainly uh, in assisting a finding that there's minimal adverse effects on open space and access to light. That was, um, that was I thought, pretty clear. So thank you. Um, let, me, uh, let me go to Commissioner Edie. Uh, thank you. And thank you for that presentation. I agree that the information presented was very helpful. Uh, but my question goes back to the uh, testimony presented by uh, George James and whether or not we are in disagreement or whether is this a different way of looking at the, some of the same analyses in terms of 
his um, assertion that almost 33% of the light would be lost. Um, yeah, so the way that the testimony was presented in that, in that test uh, by George Jaynes, it was looking at existing light only and you know, making the difference between what would be the, the, and comparing it to what would be the proposed light proposed not necessarily looking at overall that the, the court is already in shadow for most of the part uh, uh, of the year. Um, so it was looking mostly, it was comparing existing light to proposed light, not an, not an incremental increase overall. Okay. Is that, is that me, clear? Sorry. Uh, so, let me process that. If I have a further question, <laughs> I'll come back to you. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Commissioner. Commissioner Bernie. Um, yeah, thank you, Asuka. This has to be one of the most discussed five feet of rear yard in the history of the Commission. So I really uh, thank you for navigating us through it and uh, explaining it in a way that would have been very difficult for anybody to explain, I think. But you did such a great job. I hope now we can take a cue from the Church of Heavenly Rest and finally put this to rest and uh, we'll be done. Thank you. <laughs> well, well put, Commissioner. Thank you. Um, other questions, comments? Okay. Thank you, Asuka. Thank you, Ryan. Thank you very much, as always. Um, Ryan? Uh, certainly. Uh, we have 98 Third Avenue um, is scheduled for a vote on Wednesday. Amritha? Good afternoon, Commissioner. The department believes the 98 Third Avenue application and the proposed R7 DC to four district with MIH is appropriate. Third Avenue is an important north-south corridor connecting the recently rezoned Gowanus neighborhood with downtown Brooklyn, New York City's third largest central business district, and is less than five blocks from the Atlantic Terminal Regional Rail Hub. This will support the redevelopment of a gas station into nearly 30 new homes, including up to eight permanently income-restricted and rent-stabilized homes. Therefore, the department recommends approval of the application. Thank you. Thank you, Amrita. Uh, let's see if there are questions. Seeing none, thank you very much for all of your work on this. Ryan? Also, yeah, also scheduled for vote on Wednesday. Uh, we have 55 Holly Avenue, 284 Dewey Avenue, and 76 Westminster Court. Uh, just a reminder, these are non-discretionary certifications uh, for in Staten Island special districts. Um, given that, the, I will say the department does feel that they've met the findings, um, but we are going to, on these on these items, we'll forego um, an explanation from staff unless there's further questions. I think that sounds reasonable, unless yeah, anybody disagrees. I've seen Commissioner Cirillo nod, too, so that's yeah, good, good on Staten that, Island. That's items. a good sign. That's a good um, sign. I wouldn't on, want anyone to have to go through what I go through. <laughs> <laughs> on, on May 25th, uh, we have 318 College Road. Um, uh, it's a family dwelling uh, in SNAD. It's in Community District 8 in the Bronx. And this is scheduled for a vote. There was testimony in your package, um, and staff is here if, if that testimony has had raised any questions for you. Any questions on College Road? Yes, Commissioner Levin. Wait, I thought there was a letter in there saying the application has been withdrawn. Jutan, do you have one action? One action was withdrawn. Okay. On, which was the uh, lot coverage uh, authorization because they modified it to reduce it based on LPC feedback and um, the other four remain authorizations are still being. Okay, signed. so Correct. does that um, one withdrawal do oh. anything to diminish the topics that are of concern to the community board? They just don't want the thing to happen. Um, I mean, they had uh, I mean, yeah, they had they had four main concerns. Uh, changes the character; it doesn't fit within the historic district, uh, and they thought that it could be modified further, based on the ask for the uh, the side yard um, modification. Um, it doesn't necessarily affect those 
three components because two of them are directly you know, like as soon as the new building goes up, um, it changes the character historic district. Uh, I will say that uh, landmarks did weigh in um, on this and that they have given a general, their commission approved it, um, which, you know, could, um, they weigh in specifically on character and historic district component. So there is an element of that within the natural area district um, as you know, staff who's done this for um, quite a few years, I would say that it meets the intent of you know what we would typically ask, uh, especially here where they were not building within this steep slope area um, and the kind of the really natural area, and they did move it onto the flat area. Yes, it did require the additional authorization for the yard, but that is in line with the trade-offs that we oftentimes ask applicants to do in order to meet the the rules. So we feel it's it, it's in line with the intent of the special natural area district. Excellent, thank you. Uh, other questions on this? I see none. Uh, okay, Ryan. All right. Uh, for post hearing follow ups, we have Weatherall Street and 67th Avenue rezoning. Uh, Joy Razor is here to discuss. Thanks, Ryan. Hello again. Um, next slide, please. Good afternoon. Uh, this application is returning for a post-hearing follow-up after the public hearing on April 27th. As a reminder, this is a private application for a zoning map amendment from an R4B to an R6A zoning district, as well as a zoning text amendment to establish an MIH area in Forest Hills, Queens, Community District 6. Next slide. Here's an aerial view with the project area indicated in black and the development site in red. The project area is loosely bounded by Weatherall Street to the south and 67th Avenue to the east and is located two blocks south of the M and R subway lines at the 67th Avenue station. It's also served by seven bus lines. The western block ends of Weatherall Street contains existing six-story apartment buildings that were constructed around 1950 and are zoned R71. The development site includes lots 49 and 50, which are improved with two-story, two-family residential buildings owned and occupied by the applicant. Next slide. For additional context, here's a view of the back of the project area looking south. You can see the existing mid-rise multifamily apartment buildings ranging from six to 13 stories in height and constructed in the 1960s and the 1990s and are also zoned R71. Next slide. The commission raised questions and concerns during the April 25th review session and April 27th public hearing regarding the rationale of an R6A district being mapped over an existing R4B district. The contextual zoning established in the Forest Hills Regal Park rezoning in 2002 was an attempt to align zoning with the existing built context. The zoning approved by the commission aimed to serve this main objective across the rezoning area. 20 years have passed and new considerations are being brought to the commission that are site specific in nature. While predictability and consistency are important to supporting investment, zoning must also be adaptable to the changing needs of a dynamic city. The commission's consideration of an application should be informed by previous decisions, but it's wholly within the commission's purview to reconsider and update zoning in the context of the current needs of the city, borough, and neighborhood. The population of Community District 6 has increased by 6.8% over the past decade, but the number of housing units produced has only increased by 2.5%. The community board was heavily involved in the 2002 rezoning and still voted in favor of the application, citing a need for new, sustainable, and affordable housing in a neighborhood that is wealthier than the citywide average. Forest Hills has many of the qualities that make it a high opportunity area to construct more housing in the city. Next slide. In summary, the applicant is seeking two actions a zoning map amendment to rezone the project area from an R4B to an R6A district, as well as a zoning text amendment to establish an MIH area. The proposed development would rise to a height of 75 feet. It would include 21 dwelling units, five to six MIH units, and eight ground floor parking spaces. 
at this point, I'm happy to answer any questions. Great, thank you, Joy. Let's see if there are questions for you here. Commissioner Rampershad. Uh, yeah, uh, thank you very much. Um, what, did they provide any revised plans with regards to this one? This, this is the one with that whole, I brought up the issue about the refuse room and the parking. Was yes. that addressed? Uh, I only have the materials that they had provided previously. They haven't provided any revised floor plans. Can, can we ask them to provide that? Thank you. Absolutely. Yeah, we'll follow up with them. Hmm. Okay, thank you, Commissioner Bernie. Yeah, just to say, I'd also asked about uh, the issue of light and air into the apartments because they didn't seem to have enough um, fenestration. And they said in testimony, oh, yes, they were going to make that work. But again, they haven't demonstrated really and did not come back with any plans, at least if they have, I haven't seen them. So maybe you could add that to Commissioner Rampachan's request. Absolutely. Great. Thank you very much, Joy. Thank you for that uh, follow-up. Uh, Ryan, let's go to our next and what I believe may be the last uh, post-hearing follow-up. Yes, yes. The, uh, the Lirio MTA site at 806 9th Avenue. Andy Cantu is here with some discussion. Good afternoon, commissioners. Uh, can we go to slide two, please? Um, so just as a reminder, Community Board 4 voted 32 to 7 to disapprove the application with conditions. Um, they had a number of requested changes, including uh, maintaining the existing zoning districts and accommodating the MTA office space through a mayoral zoning override. Um, they uh, approved of the disposition of 35,000 square feet from the MTA building, but for residential use only, uh, not for the commercial component. Uh, they requested the elimination or reduction of office space acquisition uh, to maximize the number of affordable units. Um, they requested uh, changes to the AMI mix to be more in line with moderate and middle income uh, housing. Uh, they requested that the uh, special permit to modify non FAR bulk regulations with a text amendment to exempt the MTA and the DEP sites from lot coverage and yard requirements as of right. Uh, they re requested uh, modifications to the facade design uh, and also requested uh, that the applicant consider a grocery store for the ground floor commercial space. Next slide. Um, and the borough president uh, recommended approval with conditions uh, and his conditions largely reflected those of the community board. Next slide. So in response to the commission's questions and testimony at the public hearing, I'd just like to make some uh, clarifications and provide staff perspective. First, the community board stated that they would prefer a mayoral zoning override to accommodate the additional commercial FAR for the rail control center annex. Um, as the commission is aware, the department's longstanding view is that MZOs are not an appropriate alternative or a mechanism already exists that can achieve the project's objectives and should thus be used very sparingly in very limited circumstances. So here we believe the proposed map amendment in addition with uh, the other actions provide the appropriate avenue to, the, to support the project goals. Uh, secondly, I wanna note that uh, DCP has worked very closely with HPD to ensure the zoning proposal responds to community concerns and that the proposed actions wouldn't uh, sort of open the floodgates to dramatic changes to the special district in the future. Uh, the community board also expressed that the map amendment together with the text amendment that would expand the existing special permit provisions would signal to developers that the special Clinton district text is open to you know, more and more changes and would potentially chip away at the integrity of the special district. We disagree with that assessment. Uh, what is being proposed here is a solution to address a very narrow and specific issue on a city owned site with unique conditions to facilitate 100% affordable housing and transit infrastructure. The text amendment is very narrowly tailored so that the expanded special permit provisions are only applicable to the MTA and DEP sites. It is not applicable across the entire preservation area. 
Further, uh, the proposal builds on an existing special permit framework rather than setting a new precedent and gives the commission the discretion to decide whether the requested relief is appropriate. And as such, uh, we believe it's more conservative than the community board's alternative, which introduces new as of right bulk exemptions. As the commission is uh, well aware, zoning map and text amendments, including changes to special district regulations are common and necessary to address unique conditions and accommodate change. We view the proposal as a carefully defined rational change that is needed to help zoning evolve to meet the needs of the times and further citywide goals to support 100% affordable housing on these rare publicly owned sites in the heart of Manhattan. And lastly, with respect to the RCC Annex, any alternative that proposes to reduce or eliminate the amount of office square footage or locate MTA employees elsewhere is unworkable. Despite not being the applicant, the MTA will be providing a letter stating its support for the proposed actions and reaffirming the mission critical nature of co-locating employees adjacent to the RCC, uh, which supports the operations of the entire subway system. Next slide. Uh, as you heard of the public hearing, the primary concern of many of those who testified against the application is the AMI mix, which they believe to be contrary to the spirit of the Western Rail Yards points of agreement. I'll just reiterate that HPD has modified the original proposal to include income bans at 70% and 80% of AMI, and they are continuing to explore options to include more moderate and middle income units as part of the 40% of units that are not set aside for supportive housing uh, at the city council review stage. I think it's also important to mention that since the Western Rail Yards points of agreement were negotiated, AMI levels have changed dramatically uh, such that per HUD's 2020 updates, sorry, 2022 updates, moderate and middle income, uh, which are defined as between 81% and 165% of AMI, no longer align with what we consider to be uh, typical salaries for working folks, such as healthcare and service workers, public servants, uh, and other frontline workers. As you can see, 165% of AMI in uh, 2022, which is which the community is requesting, is now approximately $220,000 for a household of four, uh, which is significantly higher than the neighborhood's median household income of around uh, $115,000. Uh, some might argue that the income bans at 40 to 80% of AMI are more in line with what professionals such as teachers make, whose starting salaries in New York City public schools range between $61,000 and $84,000. Um, so I realize that's a lot of numbers and information all at once, but I thought it's uh, necessary to provide a little bit more clarification and context. Uh, and with that, I'm happy to take any questions you might have. Extremely helpful. Thank you, Andrew. Uh, Commissioner Goodrich. Okay, so my quick question is, and I'm pretty sure I know the answer, but I want to quadruple check. If, if so, if if the fa if a family, like let's say a family of three, I'm looking at the eighty percent AMI, um, the max there is eighty five thousand nine hundred and twenty. Um, so if they are just a smidgen over that, then they wouldn't be eligible for this housing, right? Um, I would have to get back to you. I don't know if that's a, that's an average or whether that's a, a hard ceiling. Um, I'm not, I'm not super, super familiar with how the, um, HPD term sheets work, but I can definitely get that answer for you. Okay. All right. Cause I actually thought that it was a hard ceiling. So I'm glad, I'm glad I asked. Thank you. Thanks. Commissioner Levin. And thank you for the presentation. I find the um, information about the HUD AM, changes in the HUD AMI levels um, really pretty eye-opening. Um, so thank you for presenting that. It tells me two things. Um, one is that we have a much bigger affordable housing problem in the city overall, that we shouldn't be zoning anything for anything other than option one because uh, income levels in most of our community districts haven't risen um, to the same degree as the AMI numbers you're showing us. I assume those are AMI numbers for Metro New York. That's correct. Um, which brings it, I mean, tells me that the um, 
I don't think income levels in any of the community districts that we work with have increased at anything like that. So that the, you know, the entire premise of, AM, of MIH um, may be under some stress as we face those numbers. Um, it also tells me that we're not paying teachers and nurses and, you know, public servants nearly enough money if, uh, well, that's a whole nother thing, but it's this information only reinforces that big public policy thing. So um, I just, you know, I know there's going to be a continued um, discussion about this as it um, moves from us to the city council. So I'm not going to get into that, but I just wanted to hone in on one very uh, focused um, issue that's involved here, and that has to do with the protection of the rear yards in the Special Clinton District. Um, I know you think, uh, and, I, and I know you have, carefully tailored this to focus only on those two sites. Um, but given the special characteristics of this neighborhood, I was really persuaded by the testimony that we heard that the additional language that Community Board 4 has provided, um, reinforcing the um, importance of the rear yard text by adding another sentence to make it absolutely clear that it only that the, the change here only applies to these two sites was perfectly reasonable. Um, and in fact, says what we intend. So I would hope that maybe we could take another look at including the phrase, which is just except for portions of publicly owned zoning lots adjacent to a mass transit or water supply support facility conveyed to private entity for a publicly financed affordable housing development. 20 years from now, no one's gonna remember what this whole application and conversation was about. I mean, I've been doing this for 20 years and I can tell you there are things I don't remember. Joe Ristucci has been doing it for 42 and he still remembers everything that's in there, but he's unique. Um, and I just think it's really important um, in this yard regulation text that we make it clear that any change um, is only related to these two sites. Thank you, Commissioner Levin. Um, uh, let, let us take a look at that at, at that point with a little uh, greater detail. I think it's, um, I, I certainly understand what you're, what you're suggesting and I'm, I'm, I'm sure Andrew does too. So let us, let us, uh, let us circle back on that. Um, okay, Commissioner Ortiz. Hi, yes, as usual, it's hard to follow Commissioner Levin because she made a number of the points that I wanted to make. I, I do agree that the argument around the changes in AMI um, bans are really compelling. Um, you know, but I, I want to state just a, an issue of concern that that I had, um, you know, during that hearing where, you know, HPD acknowledged that the proposal was selected, um, even though it did not comply or really take into account um, the Western Rail Yards point of agreement. Um, so I, I think that's meaningful. And I think, you know, we there's a lesson learned here um, that um, engagement, uh, particularly with community boards that are are you know, as well versed in this as community board four um, are really critical. Um, so, you know, I continue to see that as an issue, but but I do think that um, the the background that we were just offered is very compelling. So thank you. Thank you, Commissioner. Okay, uh, Ryan, anything left on our agenda for today? Uh, no, that is it for this review session agenda. Wonderful. Well, then let me thank you and uh, the staff, the entire staff of uh, the Department of City Planning. I appreciate our uh, our new methods of uh, of communicating um, the views of the department directly to the commission. I hope uh, I hope commissioners uh, agree that that is a good a good development. Um, thanks to everybody who prepared for today, commissioners. Thank you for your time, your attention. We will see you all on Wednesday at ten o'clock. Thanks very much. Thank you. Well, soon. See you Wednesday.